Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, there's four of us. We have a quorum. We're going to get started. Um, Mark Markopoulos, Commissioner Markopoulos said he's going to be a late. Um, Commissioner Price is out of town, and I have not heard from Commissioner McKee, but we're going to rock and roll. So, um, Welcome. It's the uh, business meeting tonight, uh, February 19th, 2019, uh, and we're at Southern Human Services Center. And if I can ask everyone to turn their phones to silent, that would be great. Um, and um, I'll let you all read the, the, the charge, um, and you can do that at whenever. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Okay, and I see none. Um, at our place, we have uh, 4A, we have an Awasa uh, PowerPoint. 6B is a green track PowerPoint, and then we have um, 6C uh, for reference purposes only, and that's our legislative goals. Um, and that's going to be it. So as always, Chair every Ridge, meeting we start. Chair I'm Ridge, sorry, yeah. There's uh, one other item. Sure. It, it was a suggestion uh, on additions or changes on your agenda detail to move the Arts Commission appointment <clears throat> up from 11B to possibly 4C. Okay. Since Katie Murray here is here for the arts moment, and then she could be here for a little bit longer for the Arts Commission appointment. Sure. If that's okay with the board. Okay. Does everybody agree with moving mm -hmm. the Arts Commission now to 4C? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Katie, why don't you introduce us to our artist tonight? Good evening. Aggie Statura is a first-generation American Yankee expat living in the South, specifically Chapel Hill. If she's not writing, she's most likely baking, knitting, spinning wool, or watching very, very bad TV. Her work has appeared in Fifth Wednesday Journal, Damselfly Press, The Broken Plate, Funny Times, and The Sun, among other publications. Aggie. Thank you for this opportunity. Good evening. Um, I thought about bringing something a little lighter, and then I thought, eh. So this is a short piece called Heritage. Grandpa floated down Main Street in a wingback chair, floated right past the traffic light, still blinking caution in the 12 feet of water that flooded town when the levee broke. 12 feet of water pouring into stores and homes and schools, anchored firm and proud on foundations laid in stone by earnest, broad-shouldered men on the banks of the greatest river in the world. You do what you can while there's time. You listen to mama's instructions, follow her lead on the grim triage of heirloom and necessity, what to save, what to take, what to abandon as sacrifice to the rising water. The sideboard and the kitchen table go on casters up a few inches from the wooden floor like a lady pulling up her skirts charming and useless against water that starts pouring through the screen door like water through a sieve. You snatch at paintings, china, scrapbooks to stuff into the attic, high as you can go, pull down the ladder and climb up into the hot still space, hear the house thrumming beneath you, water babbling secrets in the basement, thrusting eagerly into each dark corner, the tinkle and smash of mama's jellies and preserves, you hear it from up under the eaves with your great-grandmother's drowsing quilts. Leave the windows open. Invite the water in. Give it a way back out. Don't give it cause to linger. Don't resist. You do what you're told. You pray and you hope and you choose. But how do you choose? Which photos of which grim, distant ancestor do you put up on a high shelf? Which do you wrap snug in plastic? tuck under your shirt, press tight against your beating heart? What do you do when the wild-eyed teenager in the soaked army jacket flounders up the steps to your flooding home, rain streaming from the bill of his cap like a curtain, shouting over the sirens for you to leave now, and you're standing there with your arms full of quilts that he says you can't take? And behind him, crocheted doilies royal and spin, draping themselves over branches and stop signs and towels and televisions and children's artwork tumble past like so much garbage. And what do you do when your grandfather, who's seen locust and hail, who's been to war and sent his sons, who's done his part, played hard and fair, what do you do when he says simply, no, 
standing there next to you in the parlor up to his knees in flood. What do you say when you see him that night on the scratchy TV in a Red Cross shelter hot with sweat and despair? Your family heritage reduced to a damp blanket on a square of dirty gymnasium floor. What do you say when you see him there on the evening news, floating down Main Street in a wing-back chair and the commentator on national TV says something heartbreaking and admiring and ridiculous about the resilience of the human spirit? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very touching. Thank you. Um, um, okay, we're going to move to number two, which is public comment. And um, this is for things that are not on the printed agenda. So items that are not on the printed agenda, if you signed up for those, that will come first. If you want to speak to something that is on the agenda, um, you'll have the opportunity to sign up in the back. Um, and if you could just write that agenda item down, that would be great. Um, so we have uh, Commissioner Bedford on the clock tonight. And this is her first time, so we're going to hope she can get this down all right. Um, so no. the first person I have is uh, Karen Duncan, and the second person, Rosemary Waldoff. Chairperson Rich and commissioners, thank you for having us tonight. Welcome. And we're here on behalf of Club Nova, and I want to thank you for everything you do for us in the community. And we would not be here without you. So I'm going to yield the floor to Rosemary Waldorf. Thank you, Karen. Um, also with us tonight is um, Gretchen Davis, the Club Nova Board Chair. So um, I, I have a quick statement to make. And then if you have questions after that, Gretchen and Karen are your women. And Donna has um, written copies of what, what I'm going to say. Jamazetta, Penny, Sally, Earl, Mark, thank you so much for listening to us for a few minutes. We're, we're here to make a progress report on Club Nova. I know you're all familiar with it. Um, I'm um, co-chair of the capital campaign, um, and uh, so I speak in that behalf. And we're so appreciative of the support that our local government, government partners have given us over the years. Um, through the annual support of our programs and uh, your strong partnerships with law, our strong partnerships with our law enforcement community and the courts, and your moral support. Um, as you know, Club Nova operates as an accredited clubhouse model of psychiatric rehab. We work with folks with severe and persistent mental illness, that is to say, severe depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. And as you all know, serious mental illness tends to strike people when they're young, and it affects whether they can work, whether they can get health care. Um, it affects their school, their family, their social life. Um, it causes isolation, suicide risk, and um, poor health, crisis poverty, poverty homelessness. Uh, one in 25 adults lives with serious mental illness in a county of about 140,000 people. We figure that there are 5,000 folks who need services due to um, having serious mental illness. We see this need daily at the UNC Healthcare Emergency Department where about half the beds are taken up on any given day with by persons in mental health crisis. This this number sounds high, but it's documented and it's persistent. Um, so we have some numbers to share with you um, that testify to Club Nova's effectiveness. Uh, in terms of rehospitalization, 40% of those living with mental illness in the country are rehospitalized within a year. Club Nova's rate of rehospitalization is 12%. 25% of the nation's homeless people live with mental illness. So currently, <coughs> there is one Club Nova member who's in community house, so our rate is below 2%. Um, incarceration, none of our members have been incarcerated in the last five years. Um, but a recent study of the North Carolina prison system found that 70% have mental health issues. So we are we are warehousing our mentally ill in the prisons. Um, 
In terms of cost effectiveness, we can demonstrate that we save the community $2 million a year by keeping people out of jails and psychiatric hospitals and homeless shelters, yet we operate on an annual budget of less than a million. We can serve a member for an entire year for less than the cost of one week of psychiatric hospitalization, which is about $7,000 a week. So in terms of our future, um, we intend to construct a 12,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility on the site of our present facilities. I won't go through the numbers that are in front of you, but basically the impact of that new building and the scaling up of staff and programs to meet the capacity of that new building means that we can triple the services that we provide persons with, um, with severe and persistent mental illness. We're expanding our work with the UNC Emergency Department. So we are in a capital campaign to raise the four and a half million needed to design, build, and equip our building. To date, we've raised $2 million in cash and pledges. We have a pledge for another half million dollars from Cardinal Innovations. I know y'all are familiar with them. There are, um, I have trouble with the acronyms. It's the MCO. It's the agency through which Medicaid money comes to us. Um, but that pledge is good only if we raise 80% of our goal by the end of this year. Uh, this is a very stiff challenge, but we're working hard on it. So in this budget cycle, we are asking all our local government partners to support our capital campaign. I know that y'all don't do capital grants, but you can help us with our effort to meet this cardinal challenge. Um, we're asking our local government partners to cover $260,000 of the $300,000 we estimate it will cost us to run a transition program. In other words, to move the program to another location, pay the rent, provide the food, and then get back in once the building is built. Um, we're asking the county for $125,000. We're asking the town of Chapel Hill for $75,000. We're asking Carborough for $50,000. And we're asking Hillsborough for $10,000. And we're asking that these amounts be appropriated across two fiscal years because our transition period will extend 14 to 18 months. You know how construction is. So um, we have attached in the materials that we gave to Donna a budget for the transition. And just finally, as you weigh your decision, we ask you to consider that every year Club Nova provides a lifeline to 120 people that society has neglected. And in doing so, we save the community $2 million a year. So thank you again for your time, your consideration, and your unwavering support in the past. And if you have any questions, would be happy to try to answer them. Thank you, and that we have that w with Donna, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and we can email you questions as well, right? Sure. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the update. I have no one else on the list. Does anyone else want to speak to matters that are not on the agenda? Okay, um, let's go to announcements, petitions, and comments by board members, and I think I'll start down with Commissioner Dorson. Great. I just um, have one thing I wanted to bring up at our uh, meeting last week, work session with the fire chiefs. Um, there was a discussion about um, the uh, uh, the training facility and um, the possibility of. Uh, we're placing that facility at Durham Tech and, you know, getting an MOU together. And it, it seemed like um, while there were, are some concerns about Durham Tech, that, that my sense of the conversation was that seemed like the, the first choice given a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of criteria that the facility had, including access to water and sewer. And um, uh, so and the chiefs said that they were on a pretty tight timeline. They needed to try to pin this down by mid-March. So I would just, I don't know if this is appropriate for a petition given that timeline or just to ask that, you know, we direct staff to continue the work. I know that uh, the manager's office has been working to facilitate, facilitate those discussions between the chiefs and Durham Tech, but I really like to 
urge us to make that a high priority, and I will, uh, as the commissioner's representative on the chief's council, I would uh, be willing to be part of any of those discussions with Durham Tech um, if that would be helpful, but really think we ought to. This is a, really seems like this is a golden opportunity to, to line up a lot of things all at once, including the goals of having a Orange County Fire Academy at Durham Tech, to have this training facility, to have it be in the center of the county. Um, and so, it, you know, there's a there's an iron hot aspect to this that I really I urge us to take advantage of and would happy to participate in any way. Thank you, Commissioner Dorson. I know there's a lot of conversations that are going on currently. Um, I, I would also um, ask if you are going to meet, if you include our Durham Tech rep also, if that wouldn't be such a bad idea so that both of you can um, sort of hit them at two different angles, if that makes we sense. We talked about that previously. Yeah. Okay. Great. And they wanted some sort of decision um, mid-March. Is that what I understand? Yes. And my understanding is there's a draft MOU that's been circulating. And so I think I, I didn't realize until the meeting we had last week that mid-March was a was deadline. I knew it was soon, um, but given that, I really you know want to see if we can push that forward. Okay, we'll, we'll get we'll get information back on. Thank you, Commissioner McKee. I have no um, petitions at this point, but I would heartily endorse Commissioner Dorson's comments on the training facility and would suggest that it be expedited with all possible speed. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Green. Thanks. I just want to um, reiterate the memo that I sent you all earlier today about what I learned at the Institute for Emerging Issues uh, conference last week, which is on connecting rural and urban issues, which was very interesting. But the two um, ideas that I thought were really um, on, on topic for us was the presentation about the one Minnesota idea, which is sort of uh, it's a bigger concept than one orange, but there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, of similarities in what they're trying to do in, in Minnesota to build a, um, a statewide community that is inclusive and equitable and interdependent and, and uh, has, takes appropriate climate action, et cetera. Uh, then the other thing that I thought was really interesting and um, uh, I'm, I'm, I regret I didn't know about it yet was Project 40, a vision for regional food planning in North Carolina. And our, uh, we'll hear later about the Food Council and our, our coordinator is actually on the steering committee of it. And the, their idea is this is headed out of Wake County, but it's regional. And, and what they're working toward, why it's called Project 40, is they're working toward having 40% of our local food locally, or of our food locally sourced by the year 2040, which is, uh, um, 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 they claim an achievable goal that seems uh, really ambitious since right now that's closer to 1%, but that's just the kind of systems work that the Food Council, not just here, but in the region is doing, and I think it's worth noting. Thanks. Thank you. And also, Sally, on that report, you had something about the DHIC, yeah. about them uh, taking over the um, naturally occurring affordable housing. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. I would like to learn more about that. I think yeah. it would be great for this group uh -huh. to learn more about that. So any other information you can find? Sure. On, okay. That'd be great. Sure. And thank you for reporting back. Yeah. Really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Okay. Commissioner Markopoulos, welcome. Great to be here <laughs> <laughs> at, any, at any time. <laughs> so I went to the Agricultural Summit, which is always a great event. I always learn so much there. And a couple of things stayed with me when I, when I left, and one will be, I'll, I'll bring up when we talk about legislation that we might want to propose, but one thing I think that we should look at, and I would petition the staff to identify what would be required to have classes in Spanish at the Breeze Farm. It would be expand the opportunity for a lot of residents of Orange County if we could make that happen. Thanks. Sure. Commissioner Bedford. Uh, nothing for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a few things. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, propose that we um, create a resolution honoring uh, Professor Bill Ferris. Um, he's a UNC professor, won two Grammy Awards last year, last year, last week, um, for his uh, work on Voices of Mississippi. And he's also curated um, a photography show in Montpelier, France, as some of the some of the photographs are here now at the Love House, um, called "I Am a Man," and you can go and take a look at those photos. So I'll work with staff to um, get that resolution going. Um, I also want to congratulate the sixth advanced core class of the um, 
uh, school of government. I was in the third class, and um, they asked me to come over for lunch and congratulate the sixth class. Um, and I encourage anyone who hasn't taken that um, pro okay. do, do that program to do it. It's the ambassador program. Uh, the only thing is you have to um, dedicate a whole week because you, you actually go on campus and you stay there. You're not. You don't go home. You live with these other people for a whole week. But it's a it's a great outcome. Um, Commissioner Dorson and I are moving forward with the one orange. We keep we're baby steps we're taking. We looked at some logos and, like, like I said at the last meeting, Commissioner Dorson helped us with the mission statement. Um, and now I've spoken to the mayors, um, and they are on board with. Um, a social, and we're going to um, set that up with parks and recs of all the departments. And I spoke, I sent this over to Bonnie and Travis, and we're going to call it the um, One Orange um, Inaugural Games. So um, originally we were <laughs> going to do that in the spring, but they were saying it might be, be too tight because of budget season. So we're going to do it um, in August now. So we're I'll work with everyone to try and get that together. But they were really excited, and um, also to include the um, school boards in on that as well. Um, I also had the opportunity uh, to meet with uh, Don Saylor, who is the uh, chair of the Yolo County, California County Commissioners, and they call them supervisors out there. They're not county commissioners. I see Molly shaking her head. Um, and they, he came because um, it's, it's right outside of uh, Sacramento, and it, it covers uh, 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 Davis, where this uh, university is. It was much like what, what we have here, and he came to learn. So he went, he went to um, RTP, he went to um, the extension, and then he was over here, and we, I sent him up to PFAP. So uh, he learned a lot. He loved PFAP. They, they would love to create something like PFAP out in uh, Yolo County. So that was one of the reasons they, were, they came. So it was really exciting to, to be able to show off PFAP. We don't often get to do that. Um, and lastly, it's our sheriff's birthday, so I wish Sheriff Charles Blackwood a happy birthday. Um, okay, so now we're going to um, put something. Um, I, I sent an email around. Uh, PFAP actually asked us to uh, appoint someone to their board of directors. This is not in our packet, but I had sent an email around to everyone. I got a couple of responses back, um, and Commissioner Bedford um, showed interest in joining that board. Um, and um, there were some other questions from Commissioner Price and Commissioner Markopoulos. Uh, and then um, I spoke with Commissioner Bedford, and I think that um, it would be a good idea to appoint her. So if everybody is OK with that, we can vote on that tonight. And then next year, what will happen is the PFAP board will come back at, on a reg our regular schedule, and then someone could choose that. Um, if not Commissioner Bedford, someone else could do that at that time. So I need um, I nominate Commissioner Bedford to okay. be our representative on the PFAP board. OK. Second. Thank you. Second. Yeah. Well, I think Sally got the, I'm sorry, oh. Commissioner Green got second. So we, okay. we have all those in favor? Aye. Say, Aye. <laughs> all right. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and we'll get uh, the time schedule and everything done. You'll, Send right. that over. Yeah, they're they're in the in the email that the executive director Eric Hallman sent. Uh, right now, they meet six about six times a year, nine to eleven in the mornings. But that may change, and they have a uh, retreat coming up in February. So I will notify him tomorrow with your contact information, and then he can pick it up from there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Congratulations. Okay, we're going to move on to four proclamations, resolutions, special, special presentations. <coughs> and tonight, um, for, first up, 4A is a WASA annual update presentation. The board will receive a presentation and information from uh, um, Orange Water and Sewer Authority, WASA, on recent activities. And we have Ray DeBose and Jody Elmers. Yes. There's Ray. Oh. Hi, Ray. How I'm going to hide behind this over here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, right. I'm Ray DuBose, and this is Jody Elmers. You want to stand, Jody? And we are your two appointees to the Orange Water and Sewer Authority Board of Directors. And it's truly a pleasure and honor to serve in this capacity. Joining us tonight is Ed Kerwin, OWASA's Executive Director. We look forward to providing this brief overview of a couple of items from our January 29, 2019 annual report, which is in your agenda package. And if I seem a little nervous, I am, but I'm also shivering because I just returned from Orlando, Florida, where the highs Sunday were in the low 80s. So it's been quite a shock. Can't get enough clothes on. Mm -hmm. So we enjoyed our Awasa orientation meeting with new, newly elected county commissioners Bedford and Green on February the 7th. We were very pleased also that Chair Penny Rich established quarterly check-in meetings 
between the members of the Board of County Commissioners and your appointees to the OASA Board. We held our first meeting on January 30th, which was very productive. A summary of that meeting is in your agenda packet as well. That was a historic <coughs> occasion, and we look forward to many more meetings like that. We're doubling down on our efforts to further improve the reliability and resiliency of our water system. Over the past three months, the board approved additional investments in system resiliency, such as additional staff and equipment to exercise the almost 13,000 valves in our water distribution system, and we've added another utilities engineer position to support our capital improvements program. At our board meeting last Thursday, we authorized staff to implement within the next year or so a new model to better inform and guide decisions on renewing our water pipes where needed. Our team will continue to work closely with community partners and key stakeholders on our essential resiliency solutions. The construction for the sewer, of the sewers uh, for the historic Rogers Road area continues. Our goal is to serve the 86 historical Rogers Road legacy lots with public sewer. The red lines on the map show where the new sewer pipes have been installed and the yellow lines are the sewer pipes that will be installed by the end of April. We are about 84% complete with that project. Construction began in 2017 in September. Uh, the original contract amount was, was almost 4.8 million and there's been approximately $180,000 worth of change orders over the past, last year and a half, the largest coming from the dense rock removal. Throughout the course of the construction, we've had some hurdles to overcome, but most of these notably were the dense rock throughout the project. This slide uh, on the picture on the left shows the rock that we encountered off of Eubank Banks Road near the Orange County Animal Shelter. And the little monster on the right, in the picture on the right, is a rock grinder. That's one of the tools that we use to, to remove the rock in the path of the sewer lines. Community engagement was an important part of this project, especially when it came to conveying the message about the rock removal options and the impacts to the timeline of construction. We very much appreciate the understanding and patience by the community, and they have been great to work with. While rock was removed on certain portions of the sewer, other areas of the sewer were still being installed and production continued. We appreciate the opportunity to work very closely with the county staff and staff from Carborough and Chapel Hill on this important project as well. 2019 marks the fourth year of OASA's affordability outreach program, through which OASA has partnered with the community on advancing the affordability of our services through water conservation and efficiency. We engage a number of strategies in this program, most notably this last strategy listed here, community partnership. We have found a ready and dedicated partner with Orange County. In the last year alone, we have worked with the Family Success Alliance to share conservation outreach materials translated in Spanish, Burmese, and Karen. We have presented at a family budgeting event hosted by the Orange County Housing Authority and worked with the Department of Aging Handy Helper to stop a leaking toilet that was driving up the water bill of an elderly woman. Additionally, Mary Tiger, our sustainability manager, is attending the Orange County Local Government Affordable Housing Collaborative to stay abreast of its initiatives and how OASA can support them. We're grateful for this par partnership and look forward to other opportunities, particularly as we roll out our Agua Vista web portal to work together on showing how households can save money by saving water. Through the Care to Share program, OASA customers can contribute funds to provide payment assistance to customers in need. Currently about 1,000 OASA customers contribute to the Care to Share program on their monthly OASA bill. In 2018, on-bill contributions raised over $7,600 $7,600 for the Interfaith Council for Social Services to provide utility bill assistance. This was over $2,000 more than was raised in 2017, a 44% increase. In some, Care to Share contributions covered about 64% of the water utility bill assistance provided by the Interfaith Council for 2018. We are hopeful to see contributions increase further in 2019. We've had a promising We've had promising results from the second thank you letter campaign and we'll be incorporating care to share information 
in our outreach in the community. We're very excited about our Agua Vista project, which has upgraded over 21,000 Awasa water meters with remote read capability. This will prove to be a fantastic sustainability and customer service tool for our community. The Agua Vista web portal will be a resource in proactively notifying customers about potential water leaks. We're wrapping up our project to upgrade all of our water meters with advanced metering infrastructure that will communicate hourly water use data each day. With all the meters upgraded this spring, we're rolling out an online customer portal shown in this slide to relay this data to our customers. This system will help customers understand their water use better, identify ways to save water, and notify customers of potential leaks. If water use trends suggest a leak, the system will notify a customer and invite them to log on or register for the portal to determine if there is a leak. The portal will present daily and hourly water use data and estimate what quantity is being lost to the leaks. And that estimated leakage is shown in orange at the tops of those bars on the graph. It will then help the customer even identify and fix the source of leak. So there are other opportunities for customers to, to address the affordability of OASA services. Unconstrained by the physical meter reading cycles, we can now allow customers to select which date they want their bill to be sent. And our partners have provided us feedback that this will be helpful for customers on fixed income. Additionally, customers will be able to set up proactive notifications in the Agua Vista web portal to get notified when their water use is on track to exceed a specified bill amount. So the system will notify the customers before it's too late that they may want to conserve to avoid an unaffordable bill. And for our customers who may not have easy access to our online services and smartphones, OWASA staff will continue to proactively reach out to them about possible water leaks. For several years, the board and staff have made diversity and inclusion a priority for OWASA. And these are the two primary goals of the DNI program. Important prog progress has been made in establishing the diversity, diversity and inclusion program for charting the path ahead. With the assistance and guidance of a consultant, three employee support groups were formed and have been very active supporting the diversity and inclusion program. And we're not going to go into detail here, but the, these employee groups have been instrumental in moving the work forward in a very positive way. Our staff would be happy to share their experiences with your staff as well at any time. In addition to mandatory training for supervisors and voluntary training for all employees, the work has included new recruitment outreach and an inclusive interview and selection process. An organization assessment using employee focus groups was conducted by the consultant and resulting action plans for improvement were prepared. The WASA Board of Directors has also been busy with diversity and inclusion work. We've had five training sessions, and believe me, when you understand the differences between the people that you're working with, uh, the personal differences, then it's easier to work with them, and it's a much more efficient way to get the job done. <coughs> Board receives progress reports from staff every four months. So I just want to thank you again for having us for the annual report, and we'll be welcome to any suggestions or questions that you have tonight and, or any time in the future. Thank you, Ray. Are there any questions for Ray? We have one speaker, um, Myra Dotson. If you could just come up there, you have three minutes. Yes, I'm here um, at somewhat your invitation. Um, I'm here to address Awasa's role in greenhouse gas emissions in three counties, uh, Alamance, Orange, and Chatham. My name is Myra Dotson. I've lived in Orange County since 1972, and I've lived on Orange Grove Road since the 80s, about the time Awasa started dumping concentrated toxic sewage sludge on my neighborhood. I'm here tonight to educate and to inform and to speak about OWASA's role in um, 
greenhouse gas emissions. Orange County is the fifth most sludge county in the state out of 100 counties. Number five, when sludge is dumped on land, it contaminates water, soil, food, plants, humans, wildlife, and air. Many of the toxins are bioaccumulated as much as more sludge is dumped on the soil, meaning the quantity of toxins add up, getting greater and greater, year after year, decade after decade. Sewage sludge run, gives off gases and dusts carried by the wind. These gas and dust can travel anywhere, millions of miles away or even to Chapel Hill and Carborough. This is where sewage sludge and climate change intersect. It is hypocritical for Orange County to have Owasa play any key role in climate change actions because of the polluting activity of Owasa. They dump millions of gallons of toxic sludge each year in Orange, Chatham, and Alamance. Perhaps we should ask them how many millions of gallons of sludge they dump in the three counties, since their website leaves out that minor detail. Furthermore, Owasa has two industrial storage tanks off of Highway 54 that hold millions of gallons. The tanks have no tops. They are uncovered. So how much gas do you think is emitted from these tanks as the sewage sludge festers and decomposes in them for months on end? The very first gas that sludge gives off is mercury gas. Yes, my neighbors and I have been routinely exposed to highly toxic mercury gas for the past 40 years, not to mention the workers that dump the sludge in the field. Other gases that are continually admitted, emitted are hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide, all of which are, are considered greenhouse gases. And if you don't believe me, I brought numerous scientific published uh, articles about this. Um, I have peer re I also have handouts uh, regarding uh, EPA's recent recent um, paper on sewage sludge. So my takeaway message should be if Owasa was actively working on an alternative to poisoning farmland, air, water, and food with sludge, then and only then could I really take them seriously regarding any role in curtailing climate change. Thank you, Ms. Dotson. Thank you. Okay. Um, questions? Additional comments? Commissioner Dorsey. Well, uh, this is not <clears throat> directly related to the summary, but just the um, looking at the section on the <clears throat> Rogers Road area, it would be good at some time if we can get an update on you know the the next part once this um, once the mains are in the ground, sort of, you know, we had a long, a couple of years ago, we had long meetings about how we were going to get people connected, you know, individual houses connected. Um, and I'd like to get an update on the process of that and sort of what's going to happen from April, assuming they keep to this deadline, to going from the the mains being in the roads to getting individual houses connected and hooked up and actually getting uh, the service. And is that just an information item or would you like to petition to get? Um, it could be an information item and then depending on what we hear, we, we can, you know, there may be follow up. Yeah. So, but that doesn't have to be answered tonight. I just think sure. this has just jogged my memory that we ought to have that conversation as we're getting close to the end of this part of the project. Can I add something to that, is it, if that's okay? Sure. Um, I, I think it's important to have our partners in on this conversation as well. So it shouldn't be just us having that conversation. It should be also um, Chapel Hill and Carborough, if that's okay with. Yeah, we had some kind of ad hoc committee that was <coughs> that we were meeting and trying to sort out how it was all going to get paid for and and all that. And I don't know what what. We can we can get that information to you. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we are just accepting this, so there is nothing to vote on. Um, thank you. 
Appreciate you coming out. And so let's move over to um, 4B, resolution supporting local control of schools calendar. The board will consider a resolution expressing support for local board of educate, boards of education and the restoration of local control of school calendars and authorize the chair to sign it. And this came um, forward to us from both the Orange County School and the um, Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. And um, there is a re resolution starting on page seven of the paper. Um, agenda. I don't know what page it is on your um, electronic. Um, Commissioner Bedford, would you like to read this for us? <coughs> okay. Well, um, yes. I'd like to suggest, well, I could either after the thing is read or okay. before I have a suggested addition. Okay. So whenever that's appropriate, let's, um, yeah, Captain. let's let Commissioner Bedford read it, and then we can you can okay. give us is another whereas. Or yeah, now it's just there, another, whereas, another whereas. Yeah. Okay, All right. Commissioner Bedford, please. Resolution supporting local control of school calendars. Whereas the North Carolina general statutes give local boards of education powers of supervision and control of local school systems. And whereas local control over establishing school calendars is an integral component of school system supervision and administrative powers with which local boards of education have been vested. And whereas in 2004, the North Carolina General Assembly seized control of setting school calendars and imposed a one-size-fits-all mandate on how school calendars are to be set. And whereas the current one-size-fits-all school calendar start date is no earlier than the Monday closest to August 26, and the end date is no later than the Friday closest to June 11th. And whereas the state mandated late August start date means high schools do not complete the first semester until mid to late January. And whereas the current law essentially get, requires high school students to take first semester exams after the winter break, which negatively impacts test scores according to students and educators. And whereas the second semester for high, oops, hold on, I gotta scroll down. <laughs> For high schools starts two to three weeks later than community colleges and universities. And whereas superintendents report that the calendar misalignment makes it nearly impossible for high school students or recent winter graduates to take courses at a nearby community college or university during the second semester. And whereas exams for advanced placement and international baccalaureate classes are given on the same day nationwide, and the current calendar law shortens the amount of time North Carolina students have to learn the material before test day. And whereas it is well documented through multiple studies that children will experience a phenomenon known as summer learning loss, which has a disproportionate impact on low income children. And whereas long summer breaks can also negatively impact child nutrition, as low income children who have access to regular meals at school through the free and reduced price meal program may not have access to regular meals at home. And whereas with little flexibility built into the calendar, scheduling makeup days is extremely challenging. And whereas major hurricanes and severe winter snowstorms have caused Orange County schools to miss 17 school days over the past three years. And whereas major hurricanes and severe winter snowstorms have caused Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools to miss 16 school days over the past three years. And whereas fall sports and band begin August 1st, schedules for extracurriculars have not changed to coincide with the state mandated school calendar. And whereas local boards of education are best equipped to understand the balancing act of meeting the community's needs and maximizing student success. And whereas restoring local control of school calendars will allow local boards of education to best meet the calendar preferences of the families, educators, and businesses in our community while allowing for innovative experimental approaches to improve student achievement. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Orange County Board of Commissioners expresses its support for local boards of education and the restoration of local control of school calendars and requests that the North Carolina General Assembly and Governor Roy Cooper adopt and ratify legislation returning school calendar responsibility <coughs> to local school boards of education. Thank you. Okay, before you, pe before you move that, let's hear what Commissioner Dorsey would like to Well, do. I was just thinking of adding a whereas at uh, on the electronic copy at the, to be like a, maybe at the top of page eight, after the, the, the couple of paragraphs about the summer, I would suggest adding another whereas that says, whereas um, we encourage school districts to continue to develop or expand year-round educational programs since that goes in with the summer learning loss and I think it's an important, uh, and we do have a year round school here in Orange County and I do think it's an important to encourage that flexibility as well. Okay, comments? You're talking about that as an option? 
Yeah, I'm saying that's, you know, that we're encouraging that as we're talking about calendar flexibility. We're also encouraging school districts to develop or expand year-round learning programs. But not necessarily to have every school be year-round. No, and that, that's, it doesn't, no. Just check. Yeah, I would say every school should have a year, be year-round if that's what I was going for. Okay. Yeah. I think they should, as an aside, but I'm not suggesting that for this resolution. Okay. Well, I have a question then. Um, since this resolution is to go is going to the General Assembly, is does that fit into what the overall like? Do, do, does the school system need approval from the General Assembly to become a year-round school? No, they don't. Okay, so this is uh, aside from. The well, what I, I think it's keeping in context of the spirit of the resolution, which is that schools should have control over what they do and that not having control um, around when breaks are gonna be not only limits their flexibility, but as these two preceding paragraphs point out, cause real, tangible, adverse impacts on students, particularly uh, at-risk students, that we ought to add to that, the, that that kind of flexibility, having year-round programs, is also invaluable to the educational mission of these schools. Okay, so we're going to add that. Did you get the language on that, Donna? Okay. So move approval of the revised resolution. Second. Commissioner Bedford, second by Dorson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Okay, that passes. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move um, 11 mm. up to 4C now, and this is the one about the Arts Commission. 11B. 11B, thank you. 4C. Mm -hmm. 11B is now 4C, and um, this is, um, we're considering making an appointment to the Arts Commission, and the board <coughs> has um, made a recommendation for Justin Haslett at large. I nominate Justin Haslett. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that passes. All right, Katie, thank you for staying a little later. We appreciate it. Um, okay, we have no public hearings tonight, so this, this moves us to 6A, which is the regular agenda. And this is a memorandum of understanding with the towns for the Orange County Food Council. The board will consider entering into a memorandum of understanding, MOU, with, town, with the towns of Carborough, Chapel Hill, and Hillsborough for mutual support of the Orange County Food Council, OCFC, and authorize the chair to sign. And this is um, Manager Hamsley. Do you want to lead this conversation? I will. Thank you, Madam Chair and County Commissioners. Um, this evening I bring to you uh, the consideration of the MOU with the towns of Carborough, Chapel, and Hillsborough for mutual support of the Orange County Food Council. Before I get started, I'd just like to point out that Commissioner Green read through the MOU and identified some errors and um, in consultation with the attorney, um, once the document is executed, the document that you have before you is the document that went to Hillsborough, Carborough, and Chapel Hill. Once the um, document is approved and executed, we will make those changes. None of those changes were um, substantial. And so I've talked with, with the managers and they're fine with that as well. So we will make those changes and thank you for pointing that out, Commissioner Green. Um, Tonight, we're going to talk about the MOU. That's what's before you for approval. However, there are two other attachments. One is the Food Council coordinator position and also the draft work plan. The um, Orange County Food Council proposal is to model the Food Council after the partnership to end homelessness and um, would create an executive committee which would um, we, which would have representation of elected officials from each jurisdiction with the, um, the chair of the Food Council would also be part of that executive committee. And then um, there would be a 15, it was listed in there as a 15 member. There was an amendment from Chapel Hill to add another slot, so it, I guess it would be a 16 member Food Council, which would be made up of local government, 
educational food institutions, food-related agencies, providers, producers, citizen consumers, and the um, Chapel Hill Council requested another seat of food access. Um, in conversations with the other um, with the other managers from the other jurisdictions, they felt that that was fine. No one felt that it needed to go back for approval. We conceded that we felt that that was fine to include that seat. Um, also, um, the MOU proposes a population-based formula based on the 2010 um, census data, and those funds will pay for a um, food Council coordinator with um, some operating expenses for that position as well. The towns of Carborough and Hillsborough have approved the MOU. They did that in December of 2018, and as I said, the town of Chapel Hill approved it on January 30th with an amendment to designate a seat for food access. Um, the MOU is before you all for final approval as amended, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Questions for the manager? Okay, and I just want to point out that um, Acting Coordinator Ashley is here, as well as the um, Chair Molly. We all know them, so um, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, do I have any comments? What? I have, a, I have a, it actually is a question. Question, okay, um, let's go back. So uh, I'm trying to, um, does it say in here how the people get picked and the 15 members, the ones that are not appointed by the elected officials, and also what happens, does it, is there anything in here about what happens to the existing food council? So there is a food council now, the and food it's got- council now. Farmers and it's got yes. uh, a whole host of other good people provide you know people who are doing food access right. and right. Um, and so it, it, does this envision you know you're sort of starting with a tabula rasa and those people would apply to then for consideration only, to be appointed um, again I would the, the way that um, we're looking at this from the towns and the county perspective is the food council is exists as it is today. What this does is your approval of this as the bo as the towns have approved this will then lead us into recruitment of a food council coordinator. So that's the position that will be recruited and, um, and then will coordinate the food council. The positions will be filled the same as with the partnership and that's done through the coordinator and um, as people move on or don't, you know, then they fill those slots based on what those slots are as they're identified, food-related agencies, providers, producers. But the, the, commit, the executive committee, that would be every year um, whatever elected official chose, for example, from the board, whoever chooses to be on the food council would be part of the executive committee because each jurisdiction would have an elected official on the food council and that would become the executive committee, much like or just like the partnership. Yeah, and I was on that partnership, but I can't remember how all the other people get selected or chill, like all the providers that are on that council. They, those were selected by the Their coordinator? So the or? coordinator brings those names forward and the partnership, you know, basically approves that those people will be on the partnership. Mm -hmm. So they don't come through any elected body to be approved. Commissioner Green, did you want to add to that? Um, no, no, that that's all correct. And um, um, I'm trying to remember. I think we we might, I might need to have Ashley come up here and straighten me out. But uh, I can I have more history with the homeless partnership, and I know that there are bylaws that uh, that specify the categories of people. And the homeless partnership over time has modified those categories because of changing needs. And uh, uh, my experience on the on the as a liaison to the food council is that they are very attentive to all kinds of. Uh, uh, needs and, and communities that they're trying to balance through through mm -hmm. that process. It's not right. it's not something that's lightly done. Right, right. Is that okay, Ashley? Okay, we're good. 
Okay, so what the manager is asking us to do, the manager is recommending the board approve the author and authorize the chair to sign the memorandum of understanding, the MOU with the town of Carborough, uh, town of Chapel Hill, town of Hillsborough for mutual support of the Orange County Food Council based on the population formula based formula, and that will have the corrections in it afterwards yes. that uh, yes. Commissioner Green found and yes. also um, anything else that uh, Chapel Hill had added to it, correct? So it's now a 16-person board as opposed to yes. a 15-person board. Yes. Okay. Um, can I get a motion, please? I have another question. Ah, Commissioner Dorson. So I just want to get some clarification, some more clarification. So we're, this is not something we're starting from scratch necessarily because we have a food council. Right. So which has bylaws, which I worked on those bylaws. Yeah. Yes. And which has um, a work plan and has you know, these organizing committees and these ongoing programs. And so I just want to be clear that what we're sort of doing is framing a new structure to continue that work, yeah. or is the presumption that, that the existing organization is going to keep going until essentially a new Organization is there going to, like is this is they're going to have to start all over again with bylaws? Are they going to have to start all over again with programming or anything? I mean, because I'd hate to lose is, all the good institutional right. work that's been done. This is the only change. This is um, bringing the towns on board to fund a position that will coordinate the food council. That's basically all that's happening. This. Um, the the county has with some help from the towns has funded a half time position through outside agency and um, that really hasn't been as sustainable as we had hoped and so this is the opportunity for the towns and the county to support that position the the um, the food council will go forward as it is now um, we will, like I said, we will post the position for the coordinator and then we'll move forward once we fill that position. All right, so this is really a way of institutionalizing and creating sustainability for the right. program that we've been, exactly. that's been going so well, yes. successfully so far. So this is, an, this is actually an exciting step forward. Yes, yes. yes Green. Uh, it is an exciting step as the liaison. I'm, well, I have to say I'm happy to be the liaison to this group and just want to follow up on that and say that uh, this this request that's been made to all four jurisdictions is is uh, is coming because the food council started with non-governmental money there was a grant and from UNC and other money that was put together and um, that was always intended to be startup funding and the question was was the food council going to uh, become uh, uh, integrated within the governments, which is what we're doing, or was it going to become a, a, a permanent 501c3 and exist on private money? And uh, uh, that was a long conversation, and uh, it's been a long process to get here, but I think it's the right solution because it, w it will contribute to sustainability, and we're going to get the county and all of us are going to get a whole lot of benefit out of the Food Council just as they are going to benefit from our funding. And as I mentioned earlier, there's this it's part of a much broader movement that, that cuts across um, lines of uh, at, um, po po poverty resolution and climate change and food access and uh, yummy local food all over the county, um, all of that together. And it's really a good step forward. So I really uh, appreciate everyone's work. Yeah, and I'm really excited too. I was the liaison after Commissioner Dorson before Commissioner Green, so I was right in the middle there. And um, I know that you all have worked really hard on this and um, have been doing an amazing job, and now we know that we can continue doing an amazing job. So that's what's really important. And, and um, thank you for clarifying that, Commissioner Dorson. I think it was important to understand that the committee is, is staying a whole um, and people will cycle off when their ter ter right. term is done, but they will stay as a whole, which is with that one added position. Um, okay, so I need motion to, um, for the manager's recommendation to approve this. So moved. Second. By Green, second by Bedford. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Nay? Chair Rich, yes. can I just make one general suggestion in the spirit of one orange that even though this doesn't include Mebin, that we as we're doing these things together with all of our municipal partners that we continue at least to extend the olive branch and invite them to participate in all this stuff and you know at least continue to to live the one orange brand 
Yeah, that's a great idea. If we can get um, Ashley and Molly some information of, on who the contact in Medbin would be and see if they would like to. Uh, I'll contact um, the town manager. That's great. City manager. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> Good idea, Commissioner Dorsey. Okay, we're going to move to um, 6B now, and that's the green track, and the board will consider voting to approve the green track resolution and conceptual plan. And I know you're all familiar with this, so uh, we're going to do this pretty quickly, right, Greg? Yes, so uh, we'll have to watch the weather outside, make sure that we, we move coming. fast. Yes. Okay. Craig Bendick, Orange County uh, Planning Director. Uh, tonight's item is a... Uh, updated green track resolution conceptual plan. I'll go through uh, PowerPoint and a little bit about the history. Uh, 2002, there was a resolution of what to do with 104 acres. Um, uh, many years later, 14 years later, the county purchased an, uh, an additional 60 acres uh, for primarily preservation purposes. We brought this to the Assembly of Governments in January uh, 2000. Uh, 17, 2018, and 2019 to discuss uh, a way to reformat some of the uses in there with a certain amount of uh, goals that we had uh, involved. Some of those goals were to uh, accommodate areas for housing and mixed use development, meaning some uh, commercial, uh, reconfiguring it to accommodate a school site, which has been identified uh, for about 10 years uh, to find a place for it to land on the site there. Um, and uh, tonight's item would be to ref, uh, reformate, reformat and reconfigure those various locations there. So I'll go to uh, a map of the context of the area. The large uh, purple area is both 104 acres of jointly owned land and 60 acres of the county headwaters track. Uh, this is the ownership of the way it is now and with some color coding on uh, how it will be. The 77 acres shown in this uh, dark uh, blue here now is part of the joint ownership. The uh, light blue and the green here is what the county uh, owns. Uh, and what this map shows is that the county's track would be reconfigured to be this 40 acres and this 20 acres, which is the most environmentally sensitive lands in that general area that could be connected with these 20-some uh, acres of environmental lands. And this light blue area and this light blue area over here would be part of the joint ownership uh, similar to those other, other blue areas. When, you, when these uh, lands are swapped, uh, which is part of the process, uh, it would come out into a configuration that looks like this. And this is what uh, is the conceptual and proposed land use plan that's within the resolution. The resolution uh, has uh, noted areas that this would be the mixed use housing area. Uh, this would be the, what's uh, known as the uh, Headwaters <laughs> Preserve. Here is this joint open space here, still owned by the three entities, and a uh, housing area uh, over near the railroad tracks that's uh, mainly land banked for some future, uh, future time period. Uh, to the south uh, is a designated uh, public school site. This is still and will be jointly owned by all three governments, and not until such time as the school board uh, identifies this site as something they need, uh, would there be uh, a proposal to uh, transfer this to the uh, schools? And they would have to go, the school would have to go through a formal site plan process on uh, you know, what it looks like and what it's built. Um, there is a four acre public recreation facility that would be uh, used in conjunction uh, with the school site or it could be independent and open for this open space area plus uh, more of an, um, a recreation area uh, different than the preservation area. I do notice uh, that there are some residents from the uh, Billabong uh, community. Uh, Billabong Road is just off the map here to the south and uh, uh, was able to meet them uh, over the uh, last few years as we did the Rogers Road Community Sewer, and we obtained some easements to provide some sewer that comes through Billabong and up through here, up through Sandberg Lane, and will eventually uh, be possible to serve part of this uh, green track site with some of the sewer from the Rogers Road community. 
Uh, there was some questions by the, the community. Somebody called me this week and said, why is the school site here and not up in here? Uh, the idea of the arrangement of these uses was primarily to keep the housing all in one area to, uh, and this would be different, uh, potentially different densities in the future and po the possibility of uh, low scale uh, commercial uses to support this community and adjacent communities. So there was a clustered area put here. Uh, this school site, uh, it just happened that the size of a school site, 10 plus acres uh, could fit in this area. A concern to all parties involved is access. Um, Pure Foy Road is really the only access to the site now, but there is three other uh, avenues that are being suggested. One is a Road D, which comes uh, north of the Rogers Road community. We'll come over here to Rogers Road. A northern uh, access point, which will come up towards um, Eubanks Road to the north past the animal shelter. And a third uh, to the south uh, coming down through Marin Road. Uh, we have explored an opportunity to uh, get to Weaver Dairy Extension over here that we've contacted the rail authority and it's very problematic to have another uh, at grade rail crossing. But we'll, we'll cross that off the map, but that could also, you know, if, if by chance uh, there are avenues to cross the railroad tracks, we would also take a, a look from the west here. But that's uh, some of the uh, thoughts and the, the science uh, behind that. Uh, the elements of the resolution, this conceptual plan would say what land uses can be in certain areas and what is the rough acreage. Uh, the resolution said there could be a minor deviation. That's why we had somewhat of the blurred lines. We will have to go out there and survey these lines uh, in the future to uh, as best identify the uh, preservation areas as possible and uh, stay within a certain you know, minor deviation. Um, this, is, this plan does not lock in any amount of housing that would go on the area. Uh, that is some future decisions that will be made uh, jointly by the boards. Uh, what this resolution does do is allow us to proceed with the recombination, uh, begin transferring ownerships from the county to the, the joint, uh, joint ownership and from joint ownership to the county. Uh, that will have to come back to this board because when we have ownership of land and need to transfer it, it would be on a, a, a document, a plat, uh, to do that. So th this would uh, allow us to get started on that. Um, uh, this uh, resolution uh, would update the 2002 resolution. Uh, Carborough voted on it last Tuesday and affirmed the resolution. Uh, we have it on our agenda tonight and Chapel Hill has it on uh, tomorrow night. Uh, Next steps, don't want to really get past the resolution we're doing tonight, but there is still some more work ahead. I did speak about the recombination process up here in step one. Uh, a next step uh, after the resolution, if, if so approved, would be to determine the development and preservation goals. Uh, that means uh, how much housing, you know, uh, what type of housing would it be, uh, single family, attached housing, uh, multifamily. Uh, that's decisions to be made uh, in the summer of this year. And the implementation strategy. In the resolution tonight, and in, in the, well, not in the resolution, but under the manager's recommendation, uh, it was noted at the assembly government that we need to proceed uh, at some point pass this resolution and move into these next steps. And so we said we would do it with all due diligence to, to meet the time frames that were identified there. That is uh, both nestled in the uh, Carborough uh, um, decision and the Chapel Hill resolution. So now we have some time frames where we have to uh, bring this uh, forward and continue the work. The managers, mayors, and chairs group the MMC, of, as you've heard me mention in the Assembly of Governments, is continuing to meet. We, we meet next uh, Wednesday and uh, they have helped fill in some of the blanks and move us forward over the last uh, year plus. That is uh, my presentation. Uh, the recommendation is to uh, receive the resolution and the concept plan, discuss as appropriate, um, and if so inclined, approve the Green Track Resolution and Conceptual Plan Attachment 1 and Exhibit 1, 
and uh, recommend that we proceed with the other items in the timeline with all due speed. Any Thank questions? You. Questions? Commissioner Green. Um, Craig, what, what thought has been given so far um, about the conservation easements, both who would hold them and what's the timing? I didn't see them on the, the, time, the time frame there. Uh, I mean, I know they'd be, you have to get the uh, re re combinations and survey, all of that done first, but at least for the part that's in Orange County's hands, we can go ahead and identify, uh, maybe we can take the lead and do it first and then the joint one will, will be easy. Uh, that's correct. After we uh, find out what exactly that 60 acre shape is going to be, we could work with another entity. Uh, in the past, we have approached uh, Triangle Land Conservancy. At that time, they were not interested. Uh, but this is better environmental lands than it was before. And it shows the connectivity to this joint preserve. So we're starting to get some synergies there, which might interest a third party more. But uh, we'll put that on our docket to once uh, these uh, lands get shift, uh, reconfigured and swapped, we could pursue that conservation easement. Uh, there's also the North Carolina Botanical Garden Foundation that might be interested. Okay. Thanks. Great. Additional questions? Commissioner Markopoulos. So it looks like the, the real serious work on the development and preservation goals is gonna happen during the summer? Uh, yes. Uh, you know. And we're going to actually talk about that next Wednesday to get that out in front of us. Uh, what are the, the typical development and preservation goals and, and uh, you know, how many units could be there? What part of it might be affordable housing? Uh, the interest had been a mixed income community versus isolated, you know, affordable housing pockets. So that would get confirmed in these development goals, how we would approach uh, both the development side and the preservation side. So I foresee some serious discussions around that that might not go real quickly. And so this will be done with the, the two mayors and the chair, right, through the summer. I'm just, I'm just thinking it would be potentially useful to have a, uh, a connection to the rest of the elected officials during that process, yet it'll be in the summer. So I'm wondering um, how that might work. Well, part of the process would also be uh, we can bring back briefings and we're going to have community meetings. Uh, that is part of our agenda to hold community meetings. So at, uh, the way we've been able to move forward with the, at least the speed uh, that we have within the last few years has been to uh, kind of jumpstart it with some brainstorming to get those development goals out there, uh, have the boards kind of release it back to their, their you know, uh, associated boards. Uh, go to a community meeting when we start, you know, seeing uh, something be formed, get feedback from them, and then, like, send it through the machine one more time. So there will be community meetings involved as, as the development and preservation goals evolve on this area. And we could ask Penny to give us updates as it's as happening, it's happening and, and yes. rec you know, seek our feedback Certainly. to keep, I mean, to keep the momentum going forward. And this is huge. We really have to get this right and make the yeah. most of this opportunity. Well, just, just to follow up, I, you know, thinking back to the last AOG meeting, it seems to me like we, as, as the policymakers, we need to do some, that it's really not ideal for this to be getting, being settled during the summer because we have some decisions to make about how much affordable housing and how dense and those sorts of things. It didn't seem like we were on the same page when we talked last. Right, and I, I don't actually think it will be settled over the summer. I think that's an, an ambitious goal to try and okay. get it, anything done on, on, by the summer on this. But I, I do agree with Commissioner Dorson. I think that any time I'm in a meeting, yeah. um, it, the manager's there with me as well. So yeah. we'll, we'll bring back notes and um, we can keep that conversation going. Okay. No, we're not gonna let, we're not gonna let that ball drop for yeah. sure. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorsey, yeah, yeah, just to follow up, I mean, the key is really to just not let the summer be a time where nothing happens, right? That's and right. so to keep the That's momentum right. going, you'll be having those discussions. I think you'll, in those discussions, just from my experience being on that group last year, the, you know, the, the different positions frame out pretty quickly. And so we'll be able to know, you know, what the, what the, what the decision points are, or what the distinctions are, and then we'll, you know, when we get back here in September, we'll be able to hit the ground running on, you know, so, you know, Chapel Hill wants X and Carborough wants Y and we want Z and really be able to figure out 
you know, let's find the center of the Venn diagram and keep it moving. So that, I mean, that, I think that's the, that's the goal. It's gonna be hard, but it's, I think we should, you know, we should be as ambitious as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and in the mayor's meeting this past week, I, I think I was encouraged by the conversation we had about the green tract. I think that everybody realizes this. now's the time, and now's the time to get it right. Um, it's bringing it back to the boards that, not, not necessarily our board, but bringing it back to the Chapel Hill and Carborough boards that is the challenge. Well, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever I can to help with this um, chair because I think this is something that's really tangible that we ought to be able to make a difference on and we ought to really, you know, I mean, this is a good example of a, this where we are, you know, that the, the county moved forward to preserve this 60 acres and we did. But what we, you know, we just picked sick. We just picked the line on the map. We didn't do what we're doing now, which is picking the most important 60 acres to preserve, and so right. and maximizing the area to develop. And so, you know, this is a small step, first step, but it is really critical. And hopefully, we can, you know, with that momentum, we could keep going. I think that's right. Um, okay, so you saw what at what we were doing. So we're it, we're. Uh, receiving it, we discussed it, we did that already, and then we're going to approve and authorize the chair to sign the green track resolution and conceptual plan attachment one, including definitions as noted as exhibit one, and recommend that the timeline noted here within related to next steps ABC be pursued with due diligence. And do you want to add anything to that, Commissioner Dorson, about bringing um, y y information back? Or, or well, I think it's just, I don't think it has happened. to be in the resolution. Okay. I think it's, you know, Great. it's implied in our conversation here. Okay, someone want to make motion? So moved. Okay. Second. Commissioner McKee, Mark Coppolis, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Oh, I did it first before I said against. I got no, that. One I orange and one green. One orange. There we go. One <laughs> green. <laughs> you get cute. <laughs> All right. Oh, Commissioner Dorson, hurry back because this is, we're going to do legislative agenda. So go ahead. Yeah, I'll be right back. All right. So, we'll wait for it. Supreme Court. You, uh, you can hear speaker. it in there. Yeah. Can hear everything all right. Six C. Right, go ahead. We'll give you time. Um, all right. So Orange County's proposal 2019. You yes. had you had two individuals who raised their hand. I thought to speak, and I'm not On sure. On the green track. Yes. I, I have no one signed up for the green track. Okay. You do have to do that, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Who would like to speak on the green track? You need to come up to the podium. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't have your name down, so I didn't recognize that there was a speaker. So um, please tell us your name, and uh, you have three minutes to speak. Yeah, my name is Sam. I live in Billabong. That uh, gentleman showed the uh, track there. So thank you for the awesome work you are doing. So is it possible to bring the slide back? Um, so I have only two questions. One question is, have Orange County or any agency did any environmental impact analysis to understand where the deer goes from there? Because the other side is I-40, Rogers Road, community, this side is developed, private. So, yep. excuse me. So, I live here. This side, another development mm -hmm. happening now. You need to speak into the microphone, though, or else yeah. we can't hear you. So, so that's the one question, impact up mm -hmm. to the environment, because when rain comes, we get a lot of flood coming that way. You know, that's second concern. This is the, to be honest with you, this is the first time I heard about this happening. I live probably 300 feet to the school boundary. This is the first time, and our neighbors, the same story. First time we are hearing that this huge project is coming to light. Are we doing under the rug? No, right? Oh, no. Yeah, so I request to do an impact analysis. Like I was asking, the deer lives there, snakes lives there, where they go? Just I need the answer. Because the other side is I-40, this side development already happened. There's no other, no other place to go. That's a, you know, I consider them also 
you know, God created both animals and people. Thank you, sir. If you would, if you wouldn't mind signing up with the with the clerk, so we can have your name and information to get back to you. And who else would like to speak? And please tell us your name. James Morgan. I live on Billabong Lane. Also. Um, <clears throat> Previous iterations, I've seen this several years ago. This is the first time I've seen one with the school uh, location shown here. And I went through the, uh, the um, uh, plans online, and there are several options. And they're all showing the school in that location. Uh, <clears throat> and there are two uh, obvious issues that come up. We've just had a lot of disruption in our neighborhood along the edge of my lot, along the edge of Sam's lot, Sally's lot to put in a new sewer system, and I don't see a, an access to that sewer system from the school site shown. Um, maybe there's a, um, a resolution for that. Previously, the school, showed, school site was shown at the end of Purifoy Road, which obviously would be a, a straightforward hookup. Um, but from that location, it seems that it would have to go through uh, a, a, a private lot, and would this mean um, new easements sought by the uh, by the county. And the other, obviously, uh, <clears throat> is the Marin Road connection, which is also showing up not on these maps, but on um, uh, other maps that are on the town website that show a road connection from Marin uh, to Purifoy um, serving the school. And um, this is clearly problematic for the intersection of Marin and Homestead, um, which is uh, which, which is not capable of taking a stoplight uh, because it's so close to the railroad stoplight. And uh, uh, I, I feel this is, <clears throat> is something that needs to be addressed in the development of this plan at a pretty early stage. Thank you, sir. My name is Beverly Ferrero, and I live on Billabong. And my concern echoes uh, James' concern in that uh, this is a f just this week was the first time we saw this whole plan. And uh, the idea of making access to the school from Marin Road is rather overwhelming uh, to see how it comes out very close to the um, uh, railroad track and the development that's going in there now was not allowed to have an opening onto Marin because of the it's, it's just a small little road that goes back you know a few blocks and then connects to Billabong so the idea that that becomes a major thoroughfare is is really amazing um, uh, so I guess uh, would really ask you to consider that issue and also involving the neighbors more in an established neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and I apologize again. Oh, please come up. I apologize because I didn't have your names on here, so I didn't call. But don't leave without um, signing up. And we will keep, keep you informed. And also, when there's public meetings and any discussions that go on, we'll be able to contact you. So please, go ahead. My name is Sally Council. Um, the concept um, in, in Toto is um, not new to me because I was I participated in the Rogers Eubanks Neighborhood Associating Planning Group that came up with priorities for developing this, came back to my neighborhood with plans as they progressed, and as, as much as I could, kept people informed. And I do commend you on on some of the priorities you've addressed and come in um, in pulling this together. Um, key in those priorities were preservation of um, of our of, of the natural landscape and and I, I'm really happy to see that. The second thing was protection of the neighborhoods existing neighborhoods surrounding the, the property. Um, that, that came from all of us all around, is providing, uh, providing much of what we love about living here. I've, I've lived here since uh, the early 70s in this place. 
and um, seen a lot of change in the last five years, as uh, a lot of the community has. But we, we really did establish a priority of having a natural buffer space to protect the neighborhoods, the residents who live there now, and many of whom have lived there for generations, from traffic, from um, clearing and new construction as much as possible. And as, as, some, as my neighbors have said, we've just been overwhelmed in the last five years with things going on around us. This will actually just be, I mean, we're just encapsulated by development. So to have the school site, this is the first time, I, and I was part of it. I mean, I've been connected to this process, and this is the first time I've seen the school site butt up against um, my neighbors along Billabong Lane, and I don't see any natural original buffer there. So I, I, would, uh, I would ask, please, that that be taken into consideration inciting the school, um, we, there, I actually don't see any access from our direction. Marin Road is, we've been um, discussing the inadequacy of Marin Road getting to that property since we fought the landfill and then the transfer station. And, you know, it's just been now 30, 30 years of, so um, I would ask consideration of that also have questions about how, how sewer and water are, how, you know, I, re, I reiterate James's questions about sewer and water. And one other thing, a question I want to ask is, what's the difference between open green space and preservation of headwaters? Uh, the, the, <clears throat> the headwaters track is, would be, continue to be owned by the county that it would be for preservation purposes. The other darker green area is a jointly owned, you know, Carborough Chapel in Orange County. So it's just a, really an ownership. It's both preservation. And as we reviewed, trying to connect those, uh, those two areas together would allow, um, you know, passage of a lot of uh, a animals in that general area. But it, it would be preser preserved intact, or would there be clearing on, on that? No, they'd be primarily, uh, you know, 100% preserved. Uh, there, we can put a road through it, you know, delicately if we have to, uh, but primarily full preservation of wetlands identified in that uh, area, plus some stream buffers, um, you know, in both the areas. Okay. I would also like to say that Can these, you wrap it up, these guys have been great to work with. Okay, awesome. So and we're we're going to get you information. We're, and we're as we're, as we're working on it, we're going to make everything public. So there there's not going to be anything that's hidden. So, I, I would you like to speak on this item? Yes. Again, my name is Myra Dotson. I live out in the county, but I've been distressed to see the development around the landfill and how does this land. Uh, lay in relation to the toxic plume from the unlined uh, land, uh, landfill. Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, John, thank you. Uh, just, just one quick thing, since there are our neighbors here. Um, as you're all aware, we've recently had some legal issues uh, along Marin Road, and just so that they're reassured that nothing is happening right now. Um, that we are having to um, redo the gravel driveway from, I believe, Billabong up to the Green Tract. Uh, and that is just a driveway so that the county has southern access to, uh, or so that the county and towns have southern access to the, the property. It, it is not a public road. It is uh, just a driveway for private county use and for the use of the neighbor at the top up there. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, okay, now we're going to move on to C. Thank you all. Um, this is Orange County proposed 2019 legislative agenda. The board will consider reviewing and discussing the legislative issue work groups LIWG proposed 2019 legislative package and any other potential items for inclusion in the Orange County legislative agenda packet for the 2019 North Carolina General Assembly session 
and then we will consider to approve the 2019 priority legislative issue document and then consider to promote to uh, the Orange County legislative interest document so as you know um, the committee worked hard on this and they came up with some priorities I believe we have five uh, priorities but there are about 42 other ones on here some of our holdovers from the years in the past and some are updated uh, because some things have moved and Commissioner Dorson and Greg Wilder do you want Greg do you want to start and then we'll get uh, comments from Commissioner Dorson I certainly can um, Greg Wilder with the County Manager's Office and first my apologies for interrupting you earlier I just thought you may want to hear from them since they were sitting in the no, audience. No, thank you. I appreciate okay. it. I, didn't, I just didn't realize what was but happening. My apologies for interrupting you. No, no, absolutely. Okay. We're good. So this is Orange County's proposed 2019 legislative agenda. Greg Wilder with County Manager's Office. Um, you have a handout at your places, which is on a, I guess, a tannish uh, piece of paper that is for informational reference purposes only. Uh, relates to the adopted goals from the North Carolina Association of County, County Commissioners. Doesn't impact the package necessarily, but just thought you might like it as a reference. Um, the, uh, uh, the purpose of this uh, meeting is, as the chair uh, 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 explained, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly convened for the long session on January 30th, 2019. It's been the board's practice in past years to appoint legislative issues work group uh, to develop a draft package for board's consideration. Uh, the two commissioners for this, uh, this uh, current cycle, this current year, Commissioner Ray Commissioners Renee Price and Mark Dorson. This is obviously all their work as well as the board's work is in preparation for the March 11th legislative breakfast um, with Orange County's legislative delegation. Uh, as the LIWG was meeting, they um, determined to have, be a, have a more uh, direct and focused, short and focused set of goals. So they uh, established a goal of five to seven uh, items as the legislative priorities, and then to okay. potentially have a secondary list that incorporated items from that had been uh, among the items of interest from past years. Um, Attachment one is the draft list of the seven potential items that are recommended for the highest priority from the legislative issues work group. Um, and attachment two is the list of the uh, other items that have been of priority and continue to be of priority, but uh, didn't want to lose sight of those um, in, in this year. Uh, so the board's uh, opportunity is to review attachment one, uh, revise and amend as, as, it see wishes, as it wishes, review attachment two, revise and uh, do as it wishes with that. Ultimately, um, approve attachment one as amended, approve attachment two as amended, and then staff will work with uh, the chair to draft a cover letter to go with the package that will be presented to the delegation on March uh, 11th, 2019. Um, I defer to... Uh, um, Commissioner Dorson, if he has any things to add, and uh, um, obviously recognize Commissioner Price was involved in this process also. Commissioner Dorson. Yes, yeah, so uh, Commissioner Price and I were the Legislative Issues Working Group, and you know we looked at this long list of what is attachment two, which we've had for years. It's like 45 things long. And we felt like, given what we've heard from our legislator, legislators in the past, and also as part of the, you know, an exercise in our own uh, policymaking discipline, that it would be useful to pick a small number of high priority items and um, have that be our legislative goals. And so, um, Originally it was five, and then Commissioner Price added a couple more and got it up to seven, which she thought since there were seven of us, that was reasonable, but we're certainly not wedded to keeping seven. I think it's a good exercise in, for us to identify what the priorities are. We also thought that the long list, one of the things, the long list has a lot of redundancies to what the NCACC is proposing, and um, so I'm not sure there's any uh, particular value and highlighting, I mean, those issues are going to be presented. They're sort of general county areas of county interest, um, but really wanted to highlight things that seem to reflect um, both the particular priorities of our community as well as the unique ones that might not otherwise um, be either included at all in the Association of County Commissioners recommendations or certainly not as... Um, as clearly prioritized as we have talked about them on this board. And so the ones you see here, um, you know, the, the seven you see here, 
broadband, school issues, expansion of Medicaid, minimum wage, mental health funding, nonpartisan redistricting, criminal justice reform. I think even of those seven, um, for example, broadband is one that is a general county you know, association priority, but it, we know it's particular, of particular importance here. Um, but certainly the minimum wage increase, the nonpartisan redistricting, I'm not sure those show up the same way. And so really thought it would be worthwhile to, to highlight those or if the board chooses different ones. But rather than just send that long 47 item list to really say here is our top, you know, our top uh, uh, goals. Okay, questions for Greg or Commissioner Dorson? Commissioner Markopoulos. I don't have a question about this. I had mentioned before that I was prompted by an issue that was brought up at the Agricultural Summit uh, to propose a, a, a legislative uh, proposal. <laughs> um, so good agricultural practices gap certification was a topic at one of the uh, symposiums there. And what, what that is, is a, a process whereby a farmer is certified in how they handle the food that they produce to keep it clean. There's all these different uh, rules and policies that you would follow to become GAP certified. And that means that you can sell food to schools. If you remember, Commissioner Jacobs mm -hmm. brought that up um, in an attempt to get more farmers GAP certified in the county. And also, it, it helps in general marketing, right? If you're going to go to a restaurant, you can say that you're GAP certified. They can feel more confident that you are providing clean food to them. The biggest hurdle that I heard the farmers talking about was the expense. It could cost 1000 to $1,200 to get GAP certified. And a lot of them just say, well, I'll just go to the farmer's market and then sell, sell my stuff. And I was thinking, what? So it has to be done through the state, right? The GAP certification needs to be done through the State Department of Agriculture. And I don't know why it couldn't be done by local jurisdictions where we could do it presumably cheaper and easier. And so I would like to pursue a, some legislation that would give the local uh, jurisdictions the authority to, to GAP certify farmers. I think the manager wants to say yeah. something first. Um, the county board approved in, I think, two budgets ago, $50,000 towards GAP certification to support farmers. Um, the current, the economic development um, ag uh, position was unable to identify anyone in Orange County that wanted to participate in our program. We were willing to actually pay for that GAP certification for those farmers. And so um, I did, one of the reasons we included that session at the Ag Summit was to get more interest and to help farmers understand what that is because I asked our extension director to take part in that as well because he actually works closely with farmers and um, so our hope is is that some of those farmers will come forward but there is funds that are that is still in the budget to support farmers who want to be GAP certified. That's great. I did not hear that mentioned at that event. Um, and, you know, if there's any way to get the word out a Yeah, more I mean, we will, um, Tyrone Fisher will do that, and also Mike Artoski needs to do that and tell farmers about that. But we've been trying to do that for over two years. There were a lot of local farmers there that were clearly interested. And it was a full room, so mm -hmm. glad to hear that the option is there. So is that helpful with what you want to, or do you still think, I mean, you're still thinking of? I mean, in terms of Orange County, that's, yeah. that's helpful. I mean, I think as a statewide issue, it still has some merit. But in, in terms of what we're trying to do in Orange County, okay. I mean, I can certainly just, you know, I can suggest it on my own to our legislators yeah. if, if that's the right way to go. 
Commissioner Green. And no, I was just that was my oh. understanding too. Okay. What she she said, and I've noticed that in Durham County, Durham Durham farmers have got caught onto it because the yeah. Durham public schools are using local mm -hmm. food, and it would be great for us to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe our schools need to use produce from Durham. I don't know. Commissioner McKee. Uh, another avenue of getting this information out is the ASCS. Uh, it's a federal agency. Uh, every farmer in Orange County, in fact, every farmer in the nation that has a farm number gets uh, communications from this agency. So, uh, thank you. That would probably be your most direct avenue to the farm community. Great. Uh, additional comments? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I applaud you, Mark and um, Renee, for putting this list together. I think it's 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 nice consistency with the um, state um, proposal in adding our own uh, local flavor here with the minimum wage and the nonpartisan redistricting, et cetera. So this question is maybe just for my information, but. One that's not on the list that I'm really interested in is land, water, and agricultural preservation funding for, um, you know, easements and uh, and the like. It's number 20 on the other wish list. So I just, guess I'm just I like to hear what others have to say about. First of all, I guess to the manager, what is the health of our funding for that sort of use right now, and is this something that we it would be worthwhile to put on the main list, or is it something that's not a big concern? We um, continue to put money to, to grow our match. I think right now we're at $500,000 a year we put in so that the state will match 500000 And so um, that's always a priority for us, but we're, we have a pretty healthy fund for easements and other um, properties that we look at in through land conservation. Okay, that's helpful. Commissioner Bedford. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mark and, and Renee, for all of this work and staff. Um, I really like the, the, the seven that are, are the um, primary um, goals and wondered if it would be appropriate to add to the additional list um, uh, just a bullet about encouraging the state to fund and advocate about regarding the census to make sure that everyone participates and they don't have fear in participating. And that would go on to the oh, the, the, the big, big long list, list. Okay. the long additional list. concerns. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Greg, do you got that in yeah. some language um, for that? Yeah, we can uh, we can uh, add it as number thirty eight potentially as item number thirty eight um, census participation uh, um, pursue seek legislation pursue legislation that. Um, provide state funding to encourage participation in the upcoming 2020 census. Is that acceptable? Perfect. Okay. okay. All right. Any other comments, questions? So we have discussed this. We're going to consider approval of the 2019 Orange County Priority Legislative Issue Document and consider approving the other Orange County Legislature of Interest documents. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Mark Coppolis and Bedford, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Okay, and that passes. Thank you. Thank you to Commissioner Dorson and Commissioner Price. Um, good job. We will uh, incorporate the item from Commissioner Bedford that the board uh, just, just discussed and then um, Chair, if you'll work with me on drafting a letter as a cover letter for this, I will have it ready for the March 11th legislative breakfast. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Markopoulos, you're going to work on your efforts with the gap certification. Yeah, I'll just do that. I'll just follow up on that yeah. myself. That's great. You know, we can get in touch with Commissioner McKee and try to see if we can get our <coughs> letter on the show. That'd be great. Um, we are now moving to 6D, and this is authorization to contract with the county's financial advisor to conduct a third-party financial analysis of the new financial plan for the Durham Orange Light Rail and Transit Plan. Uh, the board will consider voting to authorize the county manager to sign an agreement with Davenport and Company LLC to provide third-party analysis of a new proposal financial plan of the Durham uh, orange light rail project at a cost not to exceed $30,000 and Travis you are going to help us present this 
Yes, thank you, Chair Rich. Uh, so as the board uh, may recall, uh, Davenport and Company, who serves as our financial advisor for uh, capital financing, uh, helped us to analyze the uh, Orange County Transit Plan's financial model uh, that uh, uh, was accompanied, the largest uh, project within that plan, of course, is the Durham Orange Light Rail System. So as we know, there are going to be changes proposed to that financial model, uh, and uh, at least two commissioners had petitioned that uh, staff engage with Davenport to uh, conduct a uh, new analysis on a proposed financial model as soon as that model is available. So what we're doing here is trying to balance sort of the need for quick action with some uncertainty. So we, we have not yet received a new financial model uh, from Go Triangle. Um, yet, uh, if we want to quickly act on engaging Davenport, we would need some authorization from the board uh, to do that and to move some money uh, uh, around to fund up to a certain not to exceed level. And in this case, the original analysis cost $30,000. Uh, as long as we receive the new proposed financial model in roughly the same format as we did in 2017, then we just need to chug it through and it won't be $30,000. It'll be some fraction of that. But uh, if we need to recreate some of the um, yeah, Excel sheets and some of the, the uh, other analytical tools that Davenport used, it, it, could, it, it could be something not up, but up to and not exceed $30,000. So with that, uh, uh, so the, what we're asking the board to do tonight is to, uh, in the case, in the event that we receive the new financial model that uh, you authorize the manager to uh, engage Davenport uh, and company in doing that analysis and then a, a budget amendment uh, to make funding available to, to pay for the analysis. Thank you, Travis. Um, we have some folks from the public that want to speak. Is it okay if we hear the public first and then we can do questions and comments? Um, okay, we have Joan Gilkey first, followed by Patricia Clayton. I'm Joan Gilkey. Good evening. Thank you, commissioners, for hearing me. Um, we can all agree that um, there have been some major changes in the light rail plans over the last year. Many of these changes significantly increase cost, and the financial review provided by Davenport and Company last year revealed significant financing costs that had not been included in the Go Triangle reports to you, to the FTA, and to the public. In light of recent plan changes and an apparent shortfall in funding, it is essential that you authorize Davenport to perform another analysis so that all parties can work from the same facts and figures. Durham Orange Light Rail is the largest effort you have ever started. Accuracy and full disclosure are absolutely necessary. I urge you to request the review tonight and the report of findings as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Clayton. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Patricia Clayton. I'm speaking on the behalf of the Northern Orange NAACP. We are concerned about the escalating costs of light rail projects and large last minute issues and risks surrounding the project. This is why we are asking you to retain independent financial advisors, Davenport and Company, to evaluate the new project plan when it comes out. At a minimum, we would like to hear Davenport analysis of the project's costs, debt, and contingency and risk to our schools and essential services. We are especially interested in the project reserves and how you will protect Orange County when the light rail project funds are gone. We are also would like to know more about operating and maintenance costs and how much of our transit taxes will be tied up to keep the trains running. That would help all of us understand how much, if any money, will be left over for buses, demand services, and other services that are needed in Northern Orange. Once we heard from Davenport, our next question to you will be when we can expect you to add services to Orange, Northern Orange. 
We, are, we pay transit taxes. We expect to see service that work. Please retain Davenport so we can all be fully informed about the costs and risks of the light rail project and its impacts on providing transit service to the Northern Orange County. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bonnie Hauser, followed by Julie McClintock. Hi, Commissioners, I'm Bonnie Hauser, and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Sly Grange and Orange County Voice. With me is Catherine Cheek, the president of the Grange. Um, we've all been following the light rail project for years, and we too are com concerned about the escalating costs and significant last minute changes. Your board won't have much, much time to consider the implications of these changes on the county's finances. That's just one of the many reasons to retain Davenport to evaluate the new, light, the, the new light rail plan when it comes out. Even if they discover that everything is fine, their fee is a small price to pay for those assurances. For our new commissioners, in 2017, Davenport ran the numbers. They were the first to fully quantify the project interest, rate, interest payments of over $800 million. Um, if Go Triangles, and they're payable until 2062. We didn't know that until then. If Go Triangles PowerPoint presentation is any indication, those interest expenses will be going up. Also, Davenport helped us all understand the cash balances, which at the time were unacceptable to your board. Um, that's why private investors were brought into the mix. It's now possible that Go Triangle will ask your board to backstop costs that you couldn't afford in 2017. As others have said, it is important that Davenport look at the cost, debt, reserves, and contingency and how that has changed since 2017. Even if you protect the $149 million cap, and we hope you do, Orange County has no protection over debt increases. There are also questions about operating costs and whether the transit taxes are sufficient to pay for them. Last summer, the Herald Sun reported that Go Triangle was planning to borrow money to run and maintain the trains. We haven't heard anything since, so we'd like to see those numbers in the new plan. In 2017, the ca project cash flows were tight for Orange County, but Durham had healthy reserves. That will change if Durham assumes hundreds of millions of dollars of additional costs. Um, if the project gets into trouble, what recourse will Orange and Durham have? The saying goes, trust but verify. It would be great to learn that everything looks great, but you can only know that if you retain Davenport to, ret to look at the finances. Thank you. Thank you. Julie McClintock. Say paper here. Good evening. I'm Julie McClintock, and a lot of excellent points have been made, and I won't repeat them. Um, and but I <coughs> want to endorse uh, hiring um, Davenport, and so that you can quickly dig into this new financial model, because we're all going to be interested in knowing how the additional costs are going to be paid for, and whether or not we can protect our essential services in schools. Um, many in the community appreciated the fact that you last uh, fall passed a resolution limiting your willingness to spend money on this project to $149.5 million plus interest. And we are asking you to stick to that in a petition that we've put out to the public. So far, we've gathered 366 signatures, and we're going to hold that and wait until you receive the cost figures and then share that with you. Um, Davenport can evaluate the transit tax revenues, um, but there are a couple additional parameters here that I'd like to mention that are also in the risk category. Um, I've been reading up on the ridership for um, the GO Triangle, uh, their estimate, which is 8 million riders a year. It's a big assumption, and uh, given this is a fixed route, we have to assume that people are really going to be riding between Duke, uh, Central, and the hospital. That is one fixed route. It does not um, allow us to get to RTP or the, or the airport or Raleigh. So um, 
I think it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a reach. And so what happens if that isn't met? Um, another aspect of the project, um, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding that, in fact, this is going to relieve congestion. I've actually really studied transportation quite a bit in Chapel Hill for the last couple of years. And 15501 is probably going to reach, reach, reach gridlock within three years. And there's really nothing to be done. Uh, or there's nothing in the hopper really to do. Um, so if people um, can't get to the station, or they're going to have to take their car to the station, um, as the guidebook pointed out, for like the Friday Center, there was nearly 80% of the way that people would get to the station would be by car. So imagine adding all those cars to 54 just to get to the station. Um, another risk here is the loss of housing, affordable housing. Um, the consultant said that, um, that worked with the Chapel Hill staff said that absolutely public investment would be the only way we would get it. And further, the EIS itself, the environmental impact statement said that gentrification was going to be a problem. Um, and finally, I think that the biggest uh, thing to worry about here is Chapel Hill transit and the triple whammy of decreasing federal <laughs> funds, increasing costs, and the light rail um, reducing the amount of money available for our bus transit. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's open it up for questions and comments. Questions first, Commissioner McKee. Yes, uh, the system manager, Marin. I know this specifically mentions $30,000 max, and I think I heard you say a while ago that if it is a straightforward uh, reprocessing through the same um, process and the same, um, I don't know, I don't know, I can't think of the word. It comes to us in the same general format and structure. That it would not be 30000 if it's just a simple reprocessing through the same process that went before. That's what I've talked to the, the Davenport uh, senior vice president about. And I know there's no way to identify what percentage of 30 that would be, so I won't ask that question. But the question I'll ask is, is there a retainage fee if we end up engaging them for possible uh, review and then we do not need for them to review for whatever reason is there a retainage fee of, of this 30,000 is there a percent that they would charge just for the uh, just for accommodating our holding that are having them on our having them on hold typically the way we would structure that is to if for some reason we terminate it we need to make sure that the termination provision is available to us you know for really any reason and we'd pay them for the work completed to date and they'd be responsible for turning over their work product completed to date okay commissioner dorson so i, I have a question um the just I want to make sure I understand. So the, we're still waiting to get final numbers or the next round of numbers. Is that? That's correct. Right. So right now there's not anything new to review. There's. That's right. And and so, okay. That's. I was. Yeah. I just want to make. I make sure I understood that. Additional questions before comments. I would have one additional question, and and Commissioner Dorsey's question was very valid. Uh, that there's nothing to review now, but uh, my only concern would be if we do not have them set in place, that there would be a t there would be a time frame from at at a certain point forward in which there would be a lag time. If we engage, if we if we move forward tonight, there's still <coughs> going to be a lag time. If we wait two weeks, there's going to be a lag. This similar lag time following the decision by this board to engage them. That's right. Is your question the time frame? How no, long my, does it my take question, them to do it? My, it's, it? My question is that my question to, to the assistant manager is essentially, is there a lag time? Okay. And, and, and I, I wasn't phrasing it right, but. Right. So, the, I mean, 
what this this the way that we've set this up the framework would allow us to as soon as we get the financial model engage uh, Davenport and allow the manager to sign a contract mm -hmm. in the absence of that and to approve a budget amendment in the absence of that we need to wait for another board cycle to do that and we all know we're also up against an April 30th deadline so trying to balance those things uh, it, you know hopefully uh, the, the we can accommodate that if the board wants to proceed uh, we can accommodate that using this sort of decision framework yeah, and that, that I guess is the better way to frame it that there is a board cycle of two weeks from the point we make a decision Commissioner Markopoulos so does that mean that if we were to uh, put some money down for a, a future analysis that we could get all that money back if uh, two weeks later we realize we didn't need the analysis yes if we, for example, never receive a final financial plan for whatever reason, we, we just don't execute the contract. Because it's really premature to or even we, request. I'm, I'm sorry, we well, would terminate the contract uh, at that time. With no penalty. With no penalty. Um, I have a question, uh, it, uh, maybe two. Um, so the first one is, is, how long would something like this take to turn around? Well, again, if it's as, if it's in the same general format, uh, you know, hopefully we could do that within a board cycle, within a two-week time frame. I, you know, we're up against that deadline, and so we'd get the board some something. We'd get as much as we could uh, to you in order to meet whatever deadline is imposed upon us. I have some comments, but I'll, I'll hold off on that. Additional questions? Commissioner Dorson. Yeah, so I just want to be clear, again, just want to make sure I understand the process. So there's going to be some additional financial information coming back from the federal government. Yes. And then, and then sometime between now and April 30th, the, the transit plan is going to come back to us to for to be voted on and that's going to include for example how Durham agreed to fill that earlier hole um, yes and and so when and also so when this money well, I mean not this money when this when the numbers come back um, I presume our our financial staff will review them and Go Triangle will review them, and Durham County's financial staff will review them also. MPO. And the MPOs will review them also. I don't know about the MPO, but I've, I've worked with the Durham County financial staff. So they'll, they'll be at least those three entities will also be reviewing those new numbers. Yes. Okay. The MPO staff is the same as the Durham County staff, so that kind of join in together on that. Okay. That's all so the questions I had. We could, yeah. We, so um, let's, let's um, do some comments now, and then we could, um, <coughs> we can see what we want, what our next steps are. So, Commissioner Rickey. Since uh, this was partially on my petition, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off. The, the reason that I had petitioned to have Davenport come back was that as we all are aware, and I think all of the board, I, I would hope all the board has taken advantage of the offer by Go Triangle to meet with John Talmadge and, and some of the staff uh, to review the possible changes that may be, may be coming forward. I uh, sat down with him last Friday afternoon for a while and the takeaway for me was that the changes through downtown Durham, the uh, open cut, the underground section, the elevated sections, uh, their thinking is $81 million price range. Now, I'm not going to even think about trying to argue any of these figures because I'm not qualified to argue the val validity or, uh, or anything else on these figures. So I'm going to take them at their word. $81 million going through downtown Durham. Uh, approximately two to three tenths of a mile. <clears throat> Going from 751 to Ninth Street through the Duke University complex, Duke Medical complex, down Erwin Road, 
it's about 1.2, 1.3 miles. Their projections were 90 to $100 million to complete that section. I'm gonna use their $90 million figure. That brings us to $171 million for those two sections. There's also a small area out at Shannon Road and University that has to have open cut and fill. I'm gonna ignore that because it, it's not, that's a good, considering these numbers is not a significant amount. Uh, there is another aspect of this that I talked with uh, Mr. Talmadge about, which was the private investment funds. Uh, they may or may not come online, but if they do not come online, that backstop that I ask about is that we're gonna be, we be in Orange and Durham County or some factor of that two counties is gonna be expected to pick it up. So let's assume that that fundraising is not gonna happen and that $82 million would be added to it, you're at 253. This will all be borrowed money. And that borrowing more than likely would be to through the TIFIA process, 3% interest on $253 million is approximately $250 million over 45 years. That the, the same time frame that is uh, the, tif the current TIFIA loans are expected to be. So if the, my ballpark figures are even close, and I think they're relatively close, you're looking at a $500 million additional cost to somebody or a group of somebody's basically Orange and Durham County. Um, the reason I petitioned to have Davenport look at this is that's not a small amount. What is a small amount is the $30,000 cost. $30,000 on $503 million, Orange County's share would be $90.5 million. The $30,000 cost would be 3.3 ten thousandths of that, of that Orange County cost. So I have made the argument in making the petition. I will continue to make the argument that it is a cost that is worthwhile. Devonport, I know our staff works for our, us and our staff does a good job. I'm not criticizing our staff by saying this, but Devonport we hired Davenport a couple of years ago specifically for their expertise. It was not a reflection on our staff. It was not a criticism of our staff. We hired them for their expertise. And I think that we ought to turn around now because ladies and gentlemen, our back is against the wall. We have a April 30th deadline imposed by the state. I don't think that we can afford not to hire them. I don't think we can afford to delay it. Uh, because there's another factor that um, Mr. Talmadge mentioned, which I don't have any clue at all whether this, and that's why I didn't put it in these numbers. There is a possibility that the FTA will uh, require an additional percentage, and I don't have a clue what that percentage would be for contingency because according to Mr. Talmadge, we're not at 30% contingency, we're down to 20%, so they may add a, additional contingency that may or may not be spent, so I'm not even gonna figure that in. But the hard cost that I can figure over the term of it, all the way out to the paying, paying these loans off, would be about $503 million. And if I'm wrong, I would like somebody to show me with numbers why and where I'm wrong. Commissioner Markopoulos. So Commissioner Key, your numbers are, are basically correct, the, the downtown cost and the uh, Irwin Road uh, elevated track through there. The added contingency is what we're going to find out from the FTA in the, in the next couple of weeks. That's why I didn't include it. And it will be added contingency. And the fundraising backstop is not, uh, having followed this process, it's not a, a major concern to me. That is based upon the fact that these fundraisers have been contacted who have made a sort of a pre-commitment commitment will not go public until the Duke uh, situation is resolved, until that cooperative agreement is signed. You can understand why. They're not going to want to get out in public before the project seems whole to them, right? And all indications are that there is a lot of interest and pre-commitment on that. And with that 
what that backstop would be would be just to have a fund that would back up that amount of money while all those other agreements were signed. You know, if, it hadn't been, if these other agreements had been done several months ago, these uh, funding agreements would have been worked on and done by now as well. So it's a, it's a timing thing with, with, this, with the you know, artificial state deadline, which you know, let's be fair, that's what uh, we're working under is an unfortunate and artificial deadline with, from the state to have everything, have the package all put together and the funding all identified by the end of April. So it would be identifying that funding with that backstop money. And Durham has indicated that they would, would be able to do that. So, you know, I hear, I've seen this petition. We passed a resolution saying that we weren't going to spend any more money. I don't understand why that requires a petition for us to say, yes, we, we really meant to do that. We meant to do that. And Durham knows that we meant to do that. And that is why they picked up the shortfall caused by the state and why they are looking at these other costs knowing that we cannot pay for those. So that's the situation. The, the difference between what was done in 2017 and what is being sort of vaguely asked to be done now by Davenport is that there were so, it was the, the entire project looking forward to all the uh, financing down through the years, very complex, so many factors that, that they worked on then. Right now, we're just waiting to hear a couple, a short list of numbers, right? We want to know what the contingency is. We want to know, you know, maybe, maybe the Duke agreement uh, generates another number. Maybe, who knows, right? Maybe out of, out of that comes a, a decision that Duke says, well, if you do this, this, and this, then we'll, we'll uh, sign the agreement. So there may be another bit of money there. So I don't see a need right now to do this, it would be premature. I don't preclude that we, we may want to do this a little bit later, but let us get the information before we spend taxpayer money on something that we may very well may be able to answer on our own. At, um, you know, at that uh, notorious meeting that, that uh, people made a mountain out of a molehill about when a whole bunch of people gathered to talk about uh, you know, speculative scenarios, there were uh, several financial people in the room. There was a Durham financial uh, person, and they have hired uh, a company from Charlotte to help them understand the finances. And it was very interesting to hear all the different uh, scenarios discussed and to realize that they, they have a pretty good handle on what's going on. And we will have access to that information. We will have access to our own staff's information, go triangle information. My point is, is that I, you know, we all want to know exactly what's going on. We all want to protect Orange County. We also have, a, a, the odds are really good that we're going to have enough information to understand everything that we need to know and to share it with, with the public that answers these questions. So I would not be in favor of committing to a premature financial audit or analysis. I would be comfortable with saying, let's, uh, you know, since we can get the, the down payment back from Davenport if we decide not to do it, I'd be okay with doing that and wait until we hear what the numbers are, wait until we have then done the research and taken advantage of the of the people that are already involved and see what we learn from that. And if then we have questions, okay, then we can take the next step. I don't think we'll need to, and I think we need to protect the taxpayer's money and, and, do, and let this process unfold and gather the information that we need before making that decision. Commissioner Dorson, Commissioner Green. Yeah, um, so I would just to follow up on that, I, I, I tend to agree with what Commissioner Markopoulos is saying. I was just thinking about what Commissioner McKee was saying in his comments. It seems like this information we're going to get in the next weeks um, 
is going to be really determinative, right? If if Duke says they're not going to do it, you know that they're not going to agree. If uh, if the contingency requirement is exorbitant, if these these numbers that Commissioner McKee was reading about the you know, the, there's going to be $500 million in added costs, given our commitment about the, the funding. You know, at that point, we're not going to need Davenport to say, this isn't going to work, right? If, if, if it actually turns out that Duke says, no, you, we're not going to let you do this, or we're not going to give any money, um, you know, we, we don't need a financial analysis to say, uh, the project doesn't work anymore, right? If we don't have the monies committed by August 30th or the gap is too big, then we're going to know that. Um, I, I think it is a different situation than the last time when we had, I'm just remembering when we had, there was like seven different scenarios, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and it was, um, it seemed like a more complex analysis was needed and I think it was valuable at that time. I feel like, you know, what we're going to know, it's going to be a lot more obvious right now. And if it isn't, then I think it would be appropriate. But it seems to me that, the, um, you know, we're kind of getting to sort of a, you know, an on-off switch, right? It's either going to be a go or it's not going to be a go. And if it's not, there's not going to be any way to, to make up that difference. So I, you know, I would be in favor of getting this information back and then determining, you know, is there an, a need for the value added that a Davenport analysis could bring? Commissioner Green. Okay, so I, I think I agree with that. Um, I, did, I was not part of this board when uh, you made the um, <coughs> resolution last year to stick to the one. 149.5, but I certainly am committed to sticking to the 149.5 and always have been from the from uh, my campaign forward. Um, certainly, if Duke doesn't come through, then there's no nothing to talk about. Um, so I think I think after that, I'm with uh, Commissioner Dorison in in the sense that if if th these numbers come back and and we're presented with um, is this a viable scenario, then I think it would be valuable to engage Davenport because the community seems to have trust in, in them as the third party analysts. And it is reassuring to know that we could perhaps get them on retainer now and then get the retainer feedback if we and things happen and we don't need them. But I think if there is a possible way forward, it would be good to have Davenport look at the numbers, but only once we know what we're working with. Commissioner Bedford. So um, I think we're all sort of saying the same things, but I'm not sure we're coming to the same conclusions or the timing. Um, so um, I'll just explain that that for me, um, part of it is, I mean, I'm, a, I'm agreeing with, with most of this, but what's been said. Um, and we know if Duke University says no, then, then the project. It's more to me, what if Duke says yes? But the costs are, we don't, and we then have some numbers. I think this resolution is just that we're pre, pre authorizing the manager to then engage at Davenport if there's questions about those numbers, which is exactly what I'm, what I would like to see done. And because I think we need to have that assurance, I like being able to compare 2017, what Davenport presented with to us in that same format to ultimately just be sure that the um, half cent sales tax and those other you know, car registration fees, the rental cars, those other three um, articles, taxes, will, with because we don't know what, I, I don't know what um, Go Triangle is going to bring to us, but that the that those revenue sources would cover our obligation. I mean, that was the ultimate decision back in 2017. And um, I think, and in particular, I don't, it, I, it assures me that if Durham is hiring an outside firm from Charlotte, um, I'm not, usually you have to have a contract to see some of that same information. It's privileged information. They'll be sharing it with the public. We'll we'll have access to perhaps the reports, but not the and and we wouldn't be able to demand variations or scenarios for our uh, um, uh, proposals. So I think it actually supports the the hiring of um, Davenport once we have numbers 
to, to review them from our perspective so that we ha can negotiate. And I think it's important to say this is not about um, terminating the project at all. I think there had been some misinformation, and some people do want that. This is about making sure that we understand the numbers as we negotiate a new cost share agreement and, um, and make sure, making sure that we have the, the funding. And I, the other reason I would want Davenport is because in those slides, there are, and it's appropriate, I realize some people might think it's inappropriate, it's very appropriate for the financial team at Go Triangle to be looking at the assumptions that have been made two years ago and ongoing. They should always be looking at their assumptions. What's the cash flow going to be um, as they receive a repayment from the federal government? What are the interest rates going to be? And that's where Davenport can plug that in and be able to then show it to us. And those visuals are so helpful. So um, I would encourage us to 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 pass this um, resolution knowing we we might not ever need to do it and if it's probably not going to cost thirty thousand dollars it's a small small amount of money and we have them ready though if we do need to it and if we need to consider well what would be that trigger you know because we're, if we're not sure um, like we know we don't need it if Duke doesn't do it but if we you know if we need to some a, a figure if we think the if it's over five million, five hundred—I mean, excuse me, five hundred million—or some other kind of trigger, where the group would would say, "Okay, now," or I, I personally would leave it to the discretion of the manager and assistant manager and finance um, director to know if they need that help. But we're just giving them authorization to not wait for you know, to save two weeks if we need it. Commissioner Markopoulos. So. A lot of the questions that you're asking to be answered were already answered in the original analysis. Like, they're not going to come back and tell us there's a different number for how much the financing is going to cost in 1939. That information is basically the same. It was only done a year ago. The, the numbers that we're dealing with now are these new numbers that we are not going to pay anyway, right? I mean, the cost of the downtown improvements, that's just a number, right? The Duke, I mean, the, the Durham needs to figure out, right? If that's the case, I'm with you. That would so, be wonderful. So the, what I'm saying is that, <laughs> that we don't need to, you know, spin our wheels over what was already figured out last year. We can just wait and see what we learn. What will affect Orange County? Like, what will affect Orange County when we get the information on the contingency and the information on any of these other added costs, right? And we get the information from the variety of financial experts that are involved that can inform us about the uh, implications of what's going on. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that the way people are talking about it, it's as if that burden is our financial burden. It is not our financial burden at this point, right? So I, I would say, we do not pre-authorize any, any analysis by Davenport. We, if anything, we say, okay, if they need to have a retainer, put it on the table, but let's wait and see if we actually need it before we waste our time and our money on something that will, in my opinion, we will likely have the answers that we need on this relatively simple situation compared to what we had Davenport do last year. May I? Oh, okay. Well, I would, mm -hmm. I would prefer to wait. You, you mentioned you had questions also, so I've had. I had comments. Okay. Oh, I mean, sorry, yeah. comments. Yeah. But I, I, I and other board members have had a chance to comment, so I would defer okay. to you. Well, then lo let's let Commissioner do yeah. Bedford. Yeah. Okay. Just so we have the back and forth. Yeah. Um, Mark, what I'm not understanding is that Orange County is on the responsible for 20% of the, uh, um, excuse me, 18.5% um, we're responsible, I think it's 18.5%, for the interest. So if the costs go up, even if Durham assumes those costs, we're still responsible for the interest, and, and um, according to the current cost share agreement. That's, well, there's and a new so, cost share agreement. And, right, so I think, what, what, wait, I couldn't hear you. There, we would, there would be a new cost share agreement, so that, so, like with this uh, shortfall caused by the state, Durham said we're going to cover that. They're going to cover it all, 
And if that's in the writing, then we don't need Davenport. And it's, if it's not in the writing, then I think we need Davenport. I'm with you. Okay. Well, uh, all I can say is that you, know, you can talk to the Durham uh, commissioners and ask them. They understand that we cannot put any more money forth. So I'm, I'm going to respond to that. That, that originally, when we started talking about that, this, um, I want to say a couple of months ago, that when we found out that the state wasn't going to cover the money, that mm -hmm. was the original conversation that we were going to come back and we were going to redo the cost share agreement, mm -hmm. um, and that's because Durham said they were going to pick pick up pick fifty seven million or whatever it was, and, yeah. and whatever the whatever the additional interest it was. So we knew that that was going to happen. Um, so, I mean, th it all ties together. We're waiting for all these numbers so then Durham can tell us yes, and then we can come back and do, and do the cost share agreement. Um, I, uh, let me just go back to saying the 149.5, when, we, when, when Mark and Mark uh, Dorson, Commissioner Dorson and Commissioner Jacobs spent hours um, working out this agreement, um, we, that was the agreement mm -hmm. that we, we all signed on to. So mm -hmm. we, and we agreed that we weren't going to go past that, ever. Mm -hmm. No one has ever asked us to change that. So I don't know where, what, where that came from, that we were changing that number. So there's, mm -hmm. there's really no, no need to, to have another resolution because we've already said we're not going to do that. Um, repeatedly in meetings, we've told Durham that we are not going to do that. So th they know where we stand. Durham, I was on the phone before the meeting tonight with Durham. They know where we stand, okay? So my comments about Davenport is, I, I think it's fine if we want to keep Davenport on, you know, on sort of like, you know, on hold and, you know, we please if you, it, mm -hmm. you know, if we get Perfect. these numbers, and it's not obvious, but I think it's going to be obvious, as Commissioner Dorson says, whether we should be able to move forward or not. I think it's going to be more obvious to Durham whether they can move forward or not, because they're the <coughs> ones that are picking up this great cost. Okay. Um, and, and they may call it before we even get a chance to call it. You know, it's, it's, that's exactly the way the conversation is going now with them, okay? Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's fine it, for me to keep Davenport sort of like, you know, in, in, in the back of our minds that we want to do that and even tell them that we may need you to turn something around pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to get locked into something with, with Davenport. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to endanger, endanger a timeline. Um, and we, we know that we're up against this April 30th deadline if this moves forward. Um, you know, we really need to be mindful of that. And, uh, I, that, that's why I was asking how long does it going to take Davenport to turn this around? Two weeks. Well, if we don't get the numbers for four weeks, you know, I, I, I don't know. And, and then let everybody ana do, the, do their analysis. Um, you know, I, I have some concerns there. So it, my concerns are endangering the timeline and mm -hmm. locking us into something, which I'm hearing that we're not going to be locked into, right? We're not going to be locked into spending any money that we're not going to use the services for, oh. right? Um, so I just want to reiterate, though, we, we signed an agreement. We spent hours and, I, you know, I, I cannot tell you how many meetings we had about this, um, both here at Echo Triangle and with Durham. Um, no one has ever asked us to change that agreement. So I don't know where that's coming from. Commissioner Rickey. Okay, first of all, no one, I agree with you, no one has asked us to change the agreement. But these changes amount to a 5% change which triggers a material change. Therefore, the current cost share agreement is not worth the paper it's written on because we have to negotiate it again. Uh, I'm, I'm quite interested in whether I'm hearing you, I mean, Commissioner, I mean Chair Rich, mm -hmm. and, and Commissioner Markopoulos definitively saying, and, and you, you walk right up to the edge on this, that Durham is gonna pick up the 81 million through the middle of Durham, the 90 plus in Duke, backstop alone Durham, the private investment, the current shortfall, 82 million, the $250 million plus interest out to the term of the loans, and the possible $200 million uh, contingency. Or, or is that what you're telling me, point blank? That who, who, else, who else would you? suppose would do that. I need to know, are you saying definitively tonight that Durham is going, because if I you're, can't, I can't if you're telling me that, that you have information that they're going to pick that up, 
I will pull my petition. Well, they are considering what their options are faced with these figures knowing that we cannot contribute. Okay. So, now, that, so who so does that leave? Here's my point. If they do this, putting Davenport on retainer or engaging Davenport, there's no cost if they don't do anything. If they do this, it, it, this action costs us nothing, period, zero. And the I'm action of engaging Davenport is to essentially put them on retainer, having them stand by, because it would be a terrible shame should we not do this and three or four weeks from now decide that we need to do this and they're engaged and don't have the ability or the time frame to do it in before April 30th. I think that's what we're all saying. I think I know, we are. I, know, but I think I'm, we we're are. Not, not saying, I think we are. We need to engage them now. I think we are. Uh, retain you. But then can what I, is the argument against to, retaining so, them? So I, can, I mean, I don't understand the argument against my petition then. I don't think I have an argument against your petition. What, what, Everybody let, is, me, let me respond to your question, though, first, because I, I think that um, you, you asked me, you asked me it, because I walked up to the edge, you said that Durham is going to pick everything up. Durham doesn't have any numbers yet either. They, they, don't. Ha they have, uh, they have uh, a few numbers that you have put up there. They know about, they're picking up the state. They know about what the tunnel is mm -hmm. going to cost. But they don't have the I, overall I picture totally as well. Agree. So you can't say, you can't ask me, is Durham picking everything up? Because the answer might be no. And that's the end of the project. And if the answer is no, That's then, the end of the project. Then, then it's over. We, we, we understand that. If Duke says no, it's over. Mm -hmm. If Durham can't make any backstops or fill it, it's over. Actually, by the cost share agreement, it's not over. It has to go to mitigation. Well, it, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be pretty much over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Chair, how, what? So, what do you um, want I'm going to put forward a motion and well, we just so see this, what the motion okay, does. Yeah, th okay. This is actually not a resolution. You're, you're saying it's a resolution. We're actually oh, just was, we're, what's we're, our next uh, directing the manager. Um, okay. And, oh, and okay. Oh, a recommendation. The county manager to sign an agreement with Davenport and third-party analysis okay. of a proposal financial plan like Durham Rail. I, 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 don't know, I don't know that that's exactly what we're doing. So if you want to give me wording that says what, if you've captured the This is the wording that I would use. Okay, this so would be okay. the wording of my motion. So let's all take a look at that before we okay. move yeah. forward. Take, take a moment to read it. Take a minute to... to what, what's in... Oh, what the manager already put there? Oh, okay. And then there's um, moving money over for the contingency $20,700. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, I would, question? I would like to add... Uh, uh, well, What's, so what, Commissioner McKee, are you making this motion? I'm making as is? yes, okay. and and the only change that uh, I would, the only wording I would add is on the <coughs> number, the first thing, consider authorizing the county manager to sign an agreement with Davenport and Company LLC to provide a third party analysis of a new proposed financial plan. I would insert um, when received. I had a feeling that it, that it, gives it, us safety. Well, I would, okay, so um, are, are you going to accept a friendly amendment or? I mean, I need yeah, exactly. a friendly amendment. Okay, so what I think we should be doing is we would consider asking Davenport to provide a third party analysis. I, I don't think there's any reason at this premature stage to commit to asking Davenport to provide a third party analysis. I, I wouldn't accept that. I, I think that we need, I, th I think we need to definitively signal that this board accepts the possibility that we'll need it. So the possibility, that's exactly what I'm saying, is the possibility. So and engage. putting the money down, putting the money down. We're not putting any money down. Well, we would uh, sign an agreement. Only if they do the work. Only if when Bonnie's ready to sign an agreement. Only when, right? Am I reading it right? Come on, Sally, you're good with I thought we had to put money down to reserve their there. time. That, that it's not, right? No. So I, I think... So if the board chose not, if you wanted, we will get a presentation on March 7th from Go Triangle. Uh, and I, at that time, you could choose to authorize the manager to sign the agreement. It just, if, what this would allow us to do is if we get the final financial plan tomorrow, right. prior to the next meeting, we could, we could begin the analysis. Now that doesn't say that we can't get you something 
if we wait until that first meeting in March. Um, but it, it, it just compresses the timeline. We won't be able to have as a, any, if we chose to have iterations, it'll decrease the likelihood of being able to run those iterations yes. in a Commissioner timely Grant. manner. I think a concern I'm hearing is that do we need to be prepared to make a refundable down payment now as a retainer in order to make sure that they can jump on it quickly after March 7th, if it's March 7th when we need them? No, we don't need a, a retainer at this point. We, okay. I've, I've put them on notice that we may be engaging their services. They know they've sent preliminary questions already that would need to be answered. So. Um, they know that we may need to take quick action. It's just a matter of how much time we want to allow for those things to happen. Could I, commissioners, can I just say, um, we're hearing that the roads are freezing up and there's a, a, a number of crashes out in the county already. Oh, um, so um, I, I hate to... Um, Safety first. I, let, let's, get, let's get a motion and let, let's move on so um, we can try and okay. get everyone out of My here. My motion is this. Thank you. And we can... We can up or down on this motion. Authorize the county manager to sign an agreement with Davenport and Company LLC to prefer to provide a third a third party analysis of a new proposed financial plan when presented to our staff for the Durham Orange Light Rail project at a cost not to exceed thirty thousand dollars and authorize staff to prepare a budget amendment that transfer funds from the board contingency line item of approximately 20,700 and the manager's miscellaneous line item to the finance department to fund this analysis. That is my motion. Second. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Oh. You got a second there. I'm second. confused here because if we don't get the information until it's almost uh, too late to do the the study, right? That's what we're worried about. We're worried, we're worried about we'll wait and, and get the information too late to do the study. But we can't do the study until we have the information, right? So there's no way out of that. Do right? no so, harm, no foul. But so that's why we that's why I think we realistically describe this as we are going to decide later whether to do this analysis. We can't, there's no way we can decide now because we don't have the information. I think that's a, a, a faulty premise that we have any kind of information to decide to do this. I covered that with the wording of when presented to our staff. Well, I mean, my motion stands up. Staff. I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm gonna let did it stand like this. Did you write that down? <laughs> so where, you put it when it's presented to our staff. Travis, can I just ask you a question? You're saying that we're meeting on, on the 7th again. Um, if that's, that's the a first Thursday. meeting in March. Yeah. It is. Okay. Um, what if we don't have any numbers by then? Like, we're, we're, we're. Well, then we're in a, just a more precarious situation in terms of timing. We don't need it. We don't yeah. And, you know, as it, maybe it's the board's choice to, you know, just push this a little, you know, maybe, maybe we wait till the 7th. And if we don't have it on the 7th, then we pull the trigger on, on this sort of uh, framework. It, you know, it's just, for us, it would just be a matter of timing. So the option of bringing this back on the 7th doesn't change anything? Well, I mean, or, or, or we, we, we want you now to, under, to have some sort of, of something in your hand so you can say to Davenport, um, we want to go. It would only be under the circumstance where we get in the final financial, proposed financial plan before the 7th that we would gain any time. Okay. All right, understood. Just one real quick thing, just to clarify what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah. I don't want an, another Alice in Wonderland scenario where, similar to this petition that you're talking about, you want to reaffirm that we're not going to spend the money when we already did it, right? Understood. If we don't clearly state the exact situation that we're in, that we don't have the numbers, and by the time we get them, there may be a time crunch. If we don't accurately state that, People in the public are going to say, well, they're hiring Davenport. They said they're going to hire Davenport. And then two weeks later, why haven't you hired Davenport? So I just want to make sure that everything's well understood 
that we, there's no way we can commit to hiring Davenport until later, and we might as well just say that, right? Commissioner Green? Well, now I'm concerned about the time frame. I'm wondering if we don't get it by the 7th, then uh, are we the ones that, that by, by committing to this resolution and committing to a, an analysis from Davenport as soon as we get the numbers, could that, could that moment be so late that we jeopardize the April 30th deadline? Well, what, if we said, what if we said we would possibly commit? We, give them, we, we, we make the commitment to them if it's a financial commitment, whatever the agreement is, but we withhold the, um, our, our ability to say we don't need to do this, which I think there's a very real possibility that we'll get information that spares us all the time and potentially money to do it. I just think we should, we still get to the same place, but if we honestly say, we honestly acknowledge that we, we may not have to do this and have that be reflected in the resolution, then I can support mm -hmm. it. Commissioner Dorsey. There you go. Well, I just wanted to ask a question. It's really, after, it comes off of Commissioner Green's um, point, which is we, we have to get the information by the 7th, right? I mean, there's, that, that is, Travis, you mentioned it might be possible that it comes before that, but it seems like at the latest, we're gonna have this presentation and we're gonna have those we're going to have that information, right? I mean, so that I mean the time is a, issue that Commissioner Green is worried about right. isn't if we don't have the. It's not getting Davenport to do an analysis or not do an analysis that's going to cause the time crunch. It's going to be when we get the when we the, get the numbers, no. right? And so I mean, that's what's going to that's what's going to push push us up against some kind of timeline. So. You know, I think, um, you know, again, I think that's the key thing. It's just, when, and I, I, th I feel like Commissioner McKee's motion gets to that. Um, and I would, the only suggestion I would say is to make it clear in the motion that we, we, we reserve the right not to use them at all or to cancel the retain, whatever the manager yes. said in there about not having to, if we don't use it, we don't. Yep. Um, you know, the way I think you read it said, as soon as we get it, we hire them. But I think what we would want to say is, as soon, you know, that, but we reserve the right to look at it and say, it's so obvious, either it's so obviously the same or it's so obviously different that we don't, something to reflect that, that contingency. Mm -hmm. We want to be prepared to hire them if we decide that we need to. Travis, did you want to add That's to it. that? That's it. Okay, Commissioner no. Bedford, did you want to add to that? Well, so we want to be prepared. I, I'm hearing all different things. The resolution has changed a couple of times here now. The um, motion hasn't changed. I mean, the at motion. All. Well, it did. It, it did because. The, well, you're, the motion hasn't changed. So, but 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 there's been the suggestions. Ideas. That, yeah, there are the ideas that that um, we're going to uh, reserve the right to cancel. Um, you did add as soon as we get the numbers. Um, and Commissioner Dorson, what was your last Isn't thing that, that you just friendly? said? I'll accept it what? as a friendly. We might not need to do it at all. Reserve yeah, I don't, um, I was, uh, you know, the manager said that we would have, we would retain the right to just cancel it at no cost if we determine that a review is not needed. Either, either way. <laughs> yeah, at no cost. I, I think just to I it just reflects Commissioner Markopoulos's point that we you know we're you know that the part of the determination is I will accept involves that if, uh, if, that's, if that's a friendly motion yeah. I'll accept it as a friendly motion. The member, uh, member. <laughs> yeah. Retain the right now to I'm cancel. I'm confused of what I'm yeah. doing. Commissioner Green, I see you analysis. Uh, no, doing an analysis. I, 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 a little I, bit lost. I'm also. Lo I mean, I I, I guess I just want to. It seems to me like there is a, there is an if there that this is not requiring the manager to do anything. Exactly, it's authorizing her to do something. And right. So, uh, okay, yeah, I'm still worried about, you know, some something being triggered that's going to make this analysis happen, which is going to push us out of the deadline. But that's right. why the friendly amendment's so okay. good. Your friendly amendment said. I accepted said, his friendly amendment. Which said what again? And retain the right to cancel. The right to cancel okay. at no cost. All right. Okay. If. If we decide we determine it's not necessary, we determine it's not necessary. Yes, the commission yeah. determines. And that could be so it does have to come reason. back to the commissioners. Yeah. Okay. I think I think we're there. Commissioner McKee, are you okay with that? It, that I know you're writing down, so you got to. Does that sound okay? 
Okay, now the only question I've got is this. We were supposed to get this new information last Friday. It's not happening. It, not here. it did not happen. Right. Last Friday, it did not happen. Right. I don't know if we'll get it tomorrow or whether we'll get it on the 6th. Given my history with Go Triangle, I would think 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 7th is probably. Well, it's the FTA. It's the FTA. But, yeah, it's well, the FTA. FTA. I know, I know that. Down. But it's going to, wherever it's going to come to us, we don't know where it's going to come from. My concern is, in a nutshell, I don't want to have this information come back tomorrow, and then we've got to sit and make a determination on the 7th. Well, I think we can ask and, Travis to make sure he stays on that. Uh, and Travis has been calling uh, Go Triangle every day. I just spoke with uh, the Durham Ca I, County Commissioners I, before this. They're, I, they're, gonna, they were told a two to three week time frame from the, from the FTA. Yeah. I not mean, I, Go I, Triangle. I know that. Not Go I, Triangle. I, I, know, I know that, but one more thing. Yeah. I'm on, if, if I might, I'm, on, I'm going to accept Commissioner Dorson's amendment with the right to cancel at no cost, but I'm going to stop there. What was the other what was the other consideration? The other consideration, if it's determined that the uh, analysis is not needed, that puts us back to the seventh. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop right at that. We can vote it up. We can vote it down. We can tie. I don't particularly care at this point. Did you want to make one last comment? I was just going to say it's not as simple as when the numbers drop. It's when we take advantage of the expertise of the uh, financial experts that are involved around this project. That's the other part of it that will give us a reason to authorize it or not. I totally right? agree. And if right? the numbers drop tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, then that's when it, they should be engaged is tomorrow morning at 8.05. Right. This motion but, does that. Okay, just so just so we're clear, and it may take them a couple of days, but but that's an that's an essential part of the process, unless we just want to just toss the money out there and go well, whatever we're happens. We're, Mar Commissioner Markopoulos, we're not tossing any money out until and unless the analysis is done. Okay, let's. Okay. let's unless is good. I like that. You right. Until that. and unless. I think that's been clear the whole time. Okay. Just want to make sure. There is no cost to us. So do we do we know what we're doing here? I think so. I don't know what we're doing. I want to be <laughs> I'm clear. I'm is really the, not are clear. Are we voting on hiring Davenport as soon as we get the numbers, without any initial analysis of whether we need there, based on those numbers, whether we need that, or are we voting to say we will hire Davenport if we if there's a, some initial review of the numbers and it's determined that we need um, that we need their services. That's what I'm not clear on. That's what I'm voting for. That's well, I don't think that's, that's what that's the motion what, that's says. That's what my motion I think what the motion okay. says is as right. soon as the numbers come, we hire Davenport. I'm not going to vote for Okay. You. May I Makes sense. read the motion as yeah. I hear it? Please. And y'all can add or delete as needed. Thank you. Because there were two additions. And by, by uh, yes. the first one, so I'm going to read it and y'all can play with it right. in that way. To authorize the county managers to sign an agreement with Davenport and Company LLC to provide a third party analysis of a new proposed financial plan when presented to staff for the Durham Orange Light Rail project at a cost not to exceed $30,000 and to retain the right to cancel. At no cost. And number two stays the same. At, at no cost. At no cost. And this, the number two stays the same. But number two stays the same, yes. That is my motion, as stated. That was the, yeah, okay. So that, oh. so, uh, uh, All right, Commissioner Green, Commissioner Bradford. I don't know. I think where the ambiguity may be coming in is, again, like I said, it authorizes the manager, doesn't require her to, which to me I'm just fine with. Me too. Yep. It authorizes her. She'll have professional discretion. Yeah. And she, yeah, huh. I'm good with that. And that's well, my motion that it authorizes her to do that. I'm not directing, what? but I'm authorizing. Commissioner Dorson, what's Well, what's I want to ask the manager, is that your understanding of the motion? That you will then have the discretion yeah, to determine whether or not to hire, when or whether to hire them? Yeah. Until we have I, I, that's not how I understand it. No. I understand it the way Commissioner McKee just described it, which is, if the numbers come out tomorrow. Come in, I authorize. Then, then, that's how I understand it, is that I'm being told that when the numbers come in, I contact Davenport and put them on the numbers. Right. So there's no there's no discretion okay. under this. All what right. we're saying Fix is it. we're giving the direction to do it. Fix it. But that's what we always do. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's fine, but that's not what was just represented. Right? No, that it's not because that's not what authorizing means to me. Or me either. 
Now we really are. Okay. I, I think it should just, I would suggest we just bring this back on the 7th yes. when we get the numbers. Yes. And then if, and then we mm. vote on this. And if the numbers are unclear, I would absolutely support that. Motion. Okay. We have a motion in a second for, for everything that was just said with, with uh, what Donna had said. And I think so, uh, Commissioner Bedford seconded. She did. She did, mm -hmm. she did originally. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's changed in here is, is uh, as soon as the numbers come in. Everything else reads the same. Okay, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Nay. Nay. Okay, so it's a two. Okay, two. So, okay. Motion okay. fails. Okay. So, Folks, you are being penny wise and pound foolish. Okay, we well, so, have another motion. So what, we, we have another motion on the floor. Is there I move uh -huh. that we bring this back to the board on the 7th that, after we have the numbers and then vote on it again at that time. That, yes, second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Comments? I would, I would like to just, won't take very long, to try an alternative motion that incorporates the fact that we not only get the numbers, but we have some time to get the, to take advantage of the expertise that's available to us and make a determination. That's the only other part of it that, that we're going to need to do if we're, if we're doing our due diligence. Well, all I'm yeah. saying is bring it back on the 7th. We can have that conversation on the 7th. I just want to avoid another it, one of these conversations. This thing just eats up so much time. And I think we're, we're, clo we're close. I would just like to see if we'd have support for that. If we want a combination of the numbers and uh, a, a modest amount of time to get uh, feedback from our local financial experts, and then make a determination. Well, the thing is, to go back to Commissioner McKee's point, if the things come down tomorrow, we'll have all that on the 7th. If the thing comes down on the 6th, then we're not going to have it on the 7th. And then we can debate it at that time and say, you know, then we could determine that we need all of it at the same time. I just don't think, you mean, I'm following on your lead is that we don't know when the thing is going to come. So why get out ahead of it, you know? And you know what, if the thing comes tomorrow, and if we feel like we can't wait till the 7th, call an emergency meeting and we'll, and we'll vote on it then. It doesn't, you know, I'll amend the motion to say if we need an emergency meeting. I, you know, again, I, I appreciate every Commissioner McKee's points and Commissioner Bedford's point in support of this. I think it's just premature because we don't have this stuff. And so, um, you know, again, I think the third party analysis is valuable, but you know, if we determine we need it. And we can't tell until we get something back. Commissioner Bedford. You're, uh, you've covered, um, because the, the risk would be that if we got numbers and they were in that range and they weren't what we're expecting from Durham, then we would lose very, you know, we would lose up to two weeks um, where Davenport could be doing the work if we wait till the 7th. Yeah. So I like the idea that we're willing to, I'm in town, um, that if we if we do get that cost share agreement and it's not what we're expecting or, or different, that we can quick, what do we need, 24 hours to call an emergency meeting, 48? Um, I honestly think that the manager... Uh, that authorized, I'm with Sally, that authorized doesn't mean you have to go do it. I mean, and I would have yielded that discretion to the manager and assistant manager, but that might not be fair since you have seven people who are so um, uh, kind of agreeing, but not. <laughs> so with the um, um, addition of that language, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'm okay. I'd amend the motion to include the language that if we need a special emergency meeting before the 7th, that one, you know, that, that we would support that. That's fine with me. Commissioner Green. Okay, Commissioner McKee. Yes, I will vote for this uh, because of, to do otherwise would be both petty and the, uh, to no effect because we need at some point to have expert uh, expertise to look at these numbers. I don't have the ability to look at these numbers and know whether they make sense. I mean, the figures I threw out, yeah, they're they're close, but they're not mm -hmm. they're not expert numbers. So right. I will vote for Just this, and I will also at the moment that uh, information drops, will be pushing for that meeting. Okay, so one, one more comment. One more smack That's at the it, dead one horse. More. <laughs> one more smack at the <laughs> dead yeah, horse. Get a little right away, all of a sudden, we're talking about when the numbers drop. We'll we'll hire Davenport. We'll decide when the numbers drop. And what I'm saying is that's only half of it. And we've got to understand that, that we have the opportunity to not spend this 
taxpayer money, and we can make a determination poss quite possibly based on information that we will have available, right? But right, right after that, then somebody says, well, when the numbers drop, we'll do this. We'll have an emergency meeting. So I'm just uncomfortable with that whole okay. thing that we noted. might fast That's track it. That's not noted. Okay. One, one more comment. All right, and, and then we're going to call it. One more comment, and I'll cease and desist. Uh -oh, don't say that. We don't want there are so many moving parts to this thing that none of us understand all of them. There are numbers that are moving on FTA. There are numbers that are moving on uh, will Durham pick up any or all of this? Are we going to have to redo? Are we going to have to completely back up? Is this thing going to die? No one knows this. Nope. Right. Nope. So, so okay. I'm, I'm good. All I'm those good in favor, say aye. 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 Against? Okay, who's the seventh? All right, we have no reports, right? None. Um, Consent agenda. Anyone pulling anything? <laughs> I think we're waiting for. Um, can, can we defer this? Can we just? Yeah. Travis, I think he's talking to Dinah. Yeah, we, they want us to get out of here, yeah. is what that they want. They want. Okay. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you want me to move approval? So should we? Don't we have a closed session scheduled? Yeah, we're going to talk to John is, about that in a second. Is it we, possible to? Is it? Right. I would move we delay it if possible. Yeah, can, we, possible. can I get approval of the consent agenda, please? So moved. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, aye. Okay, that's done. All right, manager's report. Do you have a report? I'll okay. <laughs> um, attorney's report. Do you have a report? No. Okay, appointments we can do next time, right? Yep. Okay. That's fine. Um, closed session. What do you got? Uh, we have a mediation upcoming. Uh, I do need to talk to the board about it. Okay. Okay. Can, can we shrink the time though or does it, I can make it as short as, uh, as okay. you want. All right, let me um, close to pursuant to GS143-318.11A3 uh, GS to consult with the attorney retained by the board in order to preserve an attorney-client privilege between attorney and board. I need motion to go into closed session. So moved. Dorson, Green, all those in favor? Aye. All right, let's move. It was supposed to be bad weather tonight. Yeah. Really bad. Yeah,